Hello, and welcome to our policy forum today on the net choice cases and the future of online speech. My name is Jennifer Huddleston, and I'm a technology policy research fellow here at the Cato Institute. I'd like to thank those of you who are joining us here today at the Cato Institute in Washington, DC, as well as the many of you that are joining us online. And particularly for those of you joining us online, this case should be of high interest. It should be of interest to any of us that are active users of online platforms or who care deeply about free speech. While we'll often hear these cases discussed in the terms of quote unquote big tech, as we'll hear in our various panels today, the impact of these cases could be much farther reaching, not only for a wide variety of online platforms, but for the for the future of First Amendment jurisprudence, as well as for individual internet users. We look forward to discussing all of those, all of those issues today in our various panels. We will have time for Q&A during each of our panels today. And if you're joining us online, you can submit questions using the hashtag Cato1A via Twitter or X as well as via the question and answer form on other platforms. We'll go over more details with each panel in terms of how to submit questions, and we look forward to what should be an engaging conversation. With that in mind, I am very excited to welcome to the Cato Institute, Steve Del Bianco, the founder, president, and CEO of NetChoice, the named plaintiffs in this case. 
and who has been, I believe this is the first time you've gotten to sit down for such a Q&A since the oral arguments on Monday. So welcome, Steve. Thank you for, for being here. Jen, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. So to start with, for those who are not familiar with Net Choice, we've heard these cases referred to as the Net Choice cases. They, the name plaintiffs are yourselves and an, another trade association, CCIA. What is Net Choice and why are you guys the plaintiffs in these cases? Yeah, thank you, Jen. I appreciate being here. The first thing I should do, though, is to thank you as our hosts at Cato, but also thank our co-plaintiff, the CCIA Trade Association. Uh, it's it's an arrangement of who's named first, and the Net Choice cases should be known as the Net Choice CCIA cases. They've been a great partner to us. I also want to acknowledge Cato for an outstanding amicus brief that you filed in this case, along with the other panelists here today from Tech Freedom, CGO, and Engine. And all of that helped to make the huge difference. You asked about Net Choice, and uh, Net Choice is a trade association. Our, our members are all listed on the website, and the same tech companies that all of us use every day, uh, including social media sites. Our mission is pretty simple, to make the internet safe for free enterprise and free expression. And you would think that would be easy given the origins of the web 20 years ago, but today that notion of free enterprise and free expression online are under assault from both sides of the political aisle. You know, you mentioned that you guys are a tech trade association and, and you're deeply in the world of, of tech and tech policy. My own research focuses on tech policy but these cases in some ways are bigger than tech policy. What would you say for, for someone who's not constantly focused on tech policy, or you know, you yourself are not a lawyer, uh, you, you work with some excellent lawyers, someone who's not a lawyer, what should they understand about the net choice cases and what it might mean? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, the best way to do that is to start with the origin of the net choice cases. If you think back to the election of 2020 and the Hunter Biden laptop scandal and the degree to which some social media sites for days or perhaps hours would reduce the amount of sharing of the Hunter Biden story because they wanted to ensure that it wasn't uh, hacked material or terrorist um, disseminated information. Well, that gave rise to quite a bit of resentment from Trump followers and voters. And sure enough, after January the 6th, we saw a situation where Trump looked as if he might actually disappear from the political stage. And that was not lost on Governor DeSantis, who had significant political ambitions and believed one way to seize the affections of Trump followers was to quickly punish the tech companies, the big tech companies, that had deplatformed Trump after January the 6th. That was the political origin of the Florida law that we sued in NetChoice v. Florida. It didn't take long for Governor Abbott in Texas to follow suit with his own copy of that law just a few months later. So that origin story of those bills caused NetChoice, a lobbying organization, along with many others in this room, to descend upon Tallahassee and Austin, Texas, to lobby in front of committees, multiple committees, House and Senate, to try to explain that uh, the state itself could not force social media what to carry and what to take down. I remember asking the chairman of uh, two committees I said, could you enact a law that would force the local newspaper to carry your op-eds? And the chairman answered, well, of course not. And I said, so what makes you believe you could force Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, names at the time, to carry content that they don't want to carry, you know, in offense of their user base and their advertisers? That origin story then advanced to a crescendo of court challenges at different levels and uh, appellate dis decisions an emergency appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court in, June, in May of 2022. And along the way, many of you in this room filed briefs. There were 77 helpful amicus briefs filed in these cases, among them 223 amici, many in this room today. And I think that you guys kept the fires alive for these cases and for the First Amendment. I guess that's why we call this a fireside chat. You <laughs> feel the heat coming from the seats here. And that odyssey brought us to where we were today, where there continues to be political sentiments that tech is somehow not kind to conservatives. I think that as a conservative, I find it to be the opposite. Tech is killing it on social media. We get far more ability to share our news and views with like-minded conservatives on social media than we ever did on traditional media before. 
I, I appreciate your comment that we can call this a fireside chat because of all the, the heat on the First Amendment, because I, I have a, a friend who always gives criticism about the, the false advertising of fireside chats like this without a fire. Um, you mentioned that when you were testifying before the Florida committees, you brought up, could you force a newspaper to run an op-ed? That sounds really similar to one of the questions we heard during yeah. oral arguments. We'll have an entire panel after this about oral arguments, but I was wondering if you could speak a little bit, you know, as the name plaintiff of what did you feel about oral arguments, and, and if you're willing to say even, how do you think they went? Yeah, great question. I, I feel great about how things went on Monday, and I was in the courtroom and fascinated, you know, riveted to my seat for four hours, which is, uh, which is difficult for somebody my age, I can tell you. But I, I would say two things that I would observe as a, t as a takeaway, and then one stylistic element. The first is that the notion of common carriers was a big bet for the states. It's the opening paragraph of both the laws that we sued over. This notion that they could simply declare the social media companies that NetChoice represents to be common carriers. And if that somehow paved the way for them to kick the First Amendment to the curb. And I think we heard from justices across that panel that common carrier, even if it could be applied to our companies, would not deprive of us the protections that the First Amendment grants. I think that was a huge step in the, in the direction of showing the states that they would have a long way to go. So as good as I feel about how it went Monday, I have to believe that lawyers for Texas and Florida are not feeling so good if they lose that foundational element of common carrier. Another item that came up was the discussion of Section 230. And again, we have three justices, Thomas Alito and Gorsuch, who have written before in the 2022 decision on whether to enjoin the Texas law. They believe that big tech has, in their be belief, needs to be reined in. And that belief leads them to, to, to reach for elements of an argument that could persuade the other justices. So we did hear some discussion of whether Section 230 created some inherent contradiction with the First Amendment protections that we were asserting. And I believe that we were able to show that Section 230 really has nothing to do with the First Amendment protections that we're asserting. And I think that will emerge as a distraction, but it does indicate that if you're in the room watching the justices question, they're not always directing their questions to the counsel and advocate at the table in front. Often the questions are directed to other justices on the panel in an effort to acknowledge, persuade, and bring them over to their side because it's all about striving to get to five votes. And so that was apparent as well. It will take four more months. And over that period of time, I have to believe that other cases will bear heavily on their thinking and how they write. And, and I, I want you to remember this notion of the, the Missouri v. Biden, now known as Murty v. Missouri, is coming up shortly. Um, Cato, others, many did amicus briefs in that case, and it helps to uh, it helps to focus when groups like NetChoice, CCIA, Cato, all of it together on one amicus brief that I think will help to make a big difference on that. That Murthy case will be a triangulation of the Texas and Florida cases. The Texas and Florida seemed like they were far apart because the laws themselves had different reach. But once you position the Murthy case against them, I believe we've created the perfect storm of cases. and. The Supreme Court will have an opportunity to erect a real wall to signify what the First Amendment is. And the first foundation of that wall in our case is, is to say that this wall prevents the government from directly and formally forcing us to carry speech we don't want to carry or to take down speech we prefer to keep up. Well, they need to extend that wall with a ruling in Murti. Put another 10 feet on top of that great, big, beautiful wall to show that governments and government regulators, they cannot informally they cannot indirectly cajole, persuade, or pressure social media to carry speech we don't want to carry or take down what they don't like. So it's a perfect opportunity to build a significant barrier so that the First Amendment bars government as it's intended to do. Yes, this is certainly going to be quite the term at the Supreme Court, not only for quote unquote tech issues, but really for free speech in general. And this is following what last year was a quite significant term uh, where we saw the cases of Google v. Gonzalez and Twitter v. Tamna. We also saw a ruling in 303 Creative that seemed to relate perhaps to some of the conversations we heard, particularly from Justice Gorsuch in oral arguments yesterday. But I want to turn to something that's almost a little funny 
money to me. We mentioned last term, we mentioned this term, you know, we have a significant number of tech policy or free speech focused cases. Our event today is called the net choice cases in the future of online speech. And I have to laugh to myself a little bit because when I say the net choice cases, right now we mean the two cases that were heard at oral arguments on Monday, but there are a lot of cases that could be called the net choice cases. In fact, I've lost count of how many cases your, your very active litigation center has been involved in. Can you tell us a little bit about some of those other cases that we might hear referred to as the net choice cases if say we were having this conversation this fall or, or even next year? Oh, great question. Uh, you can still count them on one hand, the cases that have uh, been adjudicated. But in California, Arkansas, Utah, and Ohio, we saw states enact laws that are very different than the Florida-Texas laws affecting content moderation, but are just similar to Florida and Texas in that they run headlong into this wall of the First Amendment. So I can uh, quickly summarize them in turn. Uh, the, all of these laws, in an effort to send the message that they want to protect minors online, not children necessarily, but minors, people up to in the age of 17 or 18. They are forcing all of us of any age to turn over sensitive personal credentials in order to be able to use the digital services that we use today. Social media services, after all, includes anything that is user-generated content. And if you check your Google search, all of the results that come back are user-generated content. The same is true of Wikipedia. Same is true, of course, of Facebook, of X, of YouTube and a plethora of social media services. None of those would be accessible to anyone under 18, which means that all of us have to prove that we are over 18, even if we're as old as I am, in order to use the services we use today. And we'd have to also establish accounts online to do that, whereas today we might just go to youtube.com without bothering to log in or use an account. So the requirement that all of us turn over sensitive personal credentials and information is a chilling effect on free speech and runs headlong into the First Amendment. And that's what we argued. We argued and received uh, rulings this year. In uh, Arkansas, we had a preliminary injunction granted in August. In California, against the age-appropriate design code, we had our injunction granted in September of 2023. California is appealing. Utah, uh, Ar Arkansas decided not to appeal, which I think is telling. And then in December, we had the state of Utah, whose Credential law also included the requirement of a curfew, a curfew that would prevent anyone under 18 from using social media online from the hours of 10.30 p.m. till 6.30 a.m. How that would work with a 17-year-old needing to do research, research on Google search or any other of the social tools, I, I don't know. And then finally, just earlier this month, we were granted a preliminary injunction against an Ohio age-appropriate design law. So that's a total of four, and I'm sure there will be more and we'll definitely need to count on help from those of you who've been so helpful on our cases against Texas and Florida to keep up the lobbying, keep up the amicus briefs, the articles, because these cases will have a long way to go. Well, I certainly have more questions I could ask, but we do have a few minutes left. Are you okay if I take a question from our audience? Does anyone in our, our live audience have a, have a question for Mr. Del Bianco? You know, I might say that, uh, I might say that the, the importance here of keeping the fires burning is, is the thing to walk away from here, is that all of you who think that now we can just take a rest for the next four months, uh, it's not just the four cases that Jen has just discussed with me, but it's the actual cases in Florida and Texas. Staff and the, and the justices will read the things that Cato puts out, the events that Cato puts on, the articles and events that the rest of you write. So we should work together to try to generate uh, the impression that the First Amendment needs to have two levels of wall and that it needs to include a ruling in Murti. I think we have a question from Ronnie. Hi. Um, granted that uh, the Congress is not good at writing laws and even less good at writing laws that will restri restrict speech and get into governing private companies that carry speech, uh, are there some things that, that you would recommend uh, for uh, the uh, social media to do to deal with the problems that the 
laws are the the new laws are are aimed at, namely, you know, bullying and suicide and and uh, hate speech. And are there ways uh, that that you would recommend that that companies can actually moderate or deal with these problems so that the government doesn't have to get into it? Yeah, a brief answer. I know you're short on time. Thank you for the question. And in all of our testimony at the state level, in Congress, and counseling with respect to the COSA legislation, uh, we have always said that the first element is to ensure that parents and children are educated about the controls that they can take, the steps that they can take, how they handle bullying if they confront it in the online world, much like we teach our kids how to handle bullying that occurs in the physical world. So education of parents and children at the appropriate age is essential. So we have worked hard to help Governor DeSantis enact that law in Florida. We have the same law in Virginia that requires school districts to include curricula about safe online conduct. A second element is social media platforms do an incredible job of identifying inappropriate material, particularly child sexual abuse material, or CSAM. We turn over tens of millions of instances of those photographs that are being shared, sometimes through direct messages and sometimes through the social media platforms. Well, only a tiny fraction of the uh, reports that we turn over are investigated, let alone prosecuted. So something that state and federal governments need to do is to provide more funding for the district attorneys, the prosecutors, and investigators to take anyone straight to court if they're involved in distributing child sexual abuse material or involved in grooming children using social media and other online platforms or bullying children. I think those are concrete steps that can make a difference immediately without any interference by the First Amendment. Thank you so much. And I know there's a lot of things to really dive into on this case. Next, we're going to turn it over to my colleague, Tommy Berry, from our Center for Constitutional Studies here at the Cato Institute to dive into some of what happened at oral arguments, both the things that I think many of us who have been following this case expect it to come up. You mentioned common carrier, and that certainly has been quite the debate, as well as some of the, the perhaps more un unexpected things that came up in oral arguments and what this may mean for, for various elements of our jurisprudence around the First Amendment and the internet going forward. But I'd ask our audience to join me in thanking Steve for, for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Jen.
All right, uh, we're going to get started with our next panel. Um, I want to remind our online audience that we will be taking questions both online and in person. Uh, for our online audience, you can join the conversation and submit questions directly on the event webpage, on Facebook, YouTube, and on X using hashtag Cato1A, <clears throat> as in First Amendment. Uh, my name is Tommy Berry. I'm a research fellow here in Cato's Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies and editor-in-chief of our Cato Supreme Court Review. And I'm thrilled to have a fantastic panelist, uh, panel here uh, to discuss the Net Choice case and specifically how the oral arguments went just two days ago. Um, so starting directly to my uh, left, we have Corbin Barthold. He is Tech Freedom's Internet Policy Council and Director of Appellate Litigation. Corbin clerked for the Honorable Stephen D. Meriday of the Middle District of Florida and the Honorable Robert H. Cleland of the Eastern District of Michigan. He was then an associate and partner in the Los Angeles office of Brown George Ross LLP, where he engaged in high-stakes complex litigation. He then served as senior litigation counsel at Washington Legal Foundation, a DC public interest firm, focusing on in appeals in, in administrative law, separation of powers, antitrust, and tech policy. He received his JD from UC Berkeley School of Law and holds a BA magna cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa from UC San Diego and an MSc with distinction from the London School of Economics. Uh, to his left, Ash Bhagwat joined the UC Davis uh, School of Law faculty in 2011. Prior to joining UC Davis, he taught at UC Hastings College of the Law for 17 years. Bhagwat is the author of The Myth of Rights, published by Oxford University Press in 2010, and Our Democratic First Amendment, published by Cambridge in 2020. He's a summa cum laude graduate of Yale University, where he received a BA with honors in history, and a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School, where he served as articles editor of the University of Chicago Law Review. He completed clerkships with Judge Richard A. Posner of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, and Associate Justice Anthony M. Kennedy of the U.S. Supreme Court. Prior to joining the Hastings faculty, Bogwad practiced appellate and regulatory law for two years in the D.C. office of Sidley and Austin. And then to his left, James Z is an associate at Clement and Murphy, which as many of you probably know, was very involved in the case we'll be discussing today. Indeed, he had the best seat in the house for oral argument. Uh, Jimmy clerked for Associate Justice Brett Kavanaugh of the U.S. Supreme Court and Judge Jeffrey S. Sutton of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. He also served as an appellate attorney for the Civil Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, where he briefed and argued cases in the Federal Court of Appeals and prepared draft briefs for the Solicitor General for filing in the U.S. Supreme Court. Jimmy graduated from Stanford Law School, where he was a Kirkland and Ellis Scholar and a member of the Supreme Court Litigation Clinic. So uh, even though you're farthest from me, Jimmy, I'll start with you just for our audience, not in everyone here we expect to be a lawyer or even necessarily to be following these cases super closely. Can you just uh, sort of give the basics of what was this case about? Uh, what, was the, what was the dispute? What's the question presented and, and why does it matter? Sure, um, so at bottom like this case is about whether the government can override decisions by you know, platforms like Facebook and Google um, and YouTube about like what content to leave up and what to take down. And so, you know, Florida and Texas passed laws, um, I think three years ago now, that basically overrode those judgments and said, you know, we think you're uh, moderating your content inconsistently and you're taking down more conservative content than liberal content. And so uh, we're gonna impose all these requirements on you. And, you know, so Florida law, for example, it says, uh, you're not allowed to take down um, content about political candidates, uh, anything posted by journalistic enterprises, um, you have to you have to uh, you have to apply your standards consistently. And the Texas law, similarly, it says you're not allowed to engage in viewpoint discrimination when you decide what to take down and what to keep up. So, mm -hmm. um, and the question presented in the court was whether that that is consistent with the First Amendment. Great. And Corbin, I'm wondering, can you give a little background on kind of how did we get to this moment? Why, why is this now coming up to the court? Why are we now seeing laws passed like this? And, and uh, what sort of led, do you think, Florida and Texas to, to think that this was necessary? Uh, well, to answer that question, we have to get into a time machine and go back to this long lost world before Elon Musk purchased Twitter uh, and turned it into X. <coughs> um, Early, uh, early 2021, um, there was a lot of rancor, uh, particularly on the political right, about the content moderation decisions of uh, Twitter in particular. We all remember the uh, Hunter Biden laptop New York Post story. That was kind of the bloody red shirt that got waved around when that story was 
um, temporarily uh, blocked and suppressed on Twitter and Facebook. So you had this campaign uh, starting with uh, Florida passed SB 7072 first and then Texas did HB 20 uh, to get the uh, big tech oligarchs of Silicon Valley to stop silencing conservative speech. Um, I'm pretty strictly you know, paraphrasing things that were actually said by these politicians and we might get into what is the impact of those statements on this case because they then put those uh, laws together in ways that kind of took that goal maybe a little out of the actual text, or maybe not, we can discuss. Uh, but that was the impetus, was to level the speech playing field, to level the speech marketplace on these platforms. Um, another topic we may get into is how much more broadly these laws sweep. They do much more than uh, intended, if that's the goal of the laws. Uh, but that's what spurred us on. We then, uh, net choice, as we heard earlier, you know went into the district court very quickly. Both the district courts in Florida and Texas enjoined these laws. Uh, the 11th Circuit, at least with the key provisions we'll probably focus on today, affirmed. Um, the 5th Circuit issued a, uh, a ruling without opinion uh, letting HB 20 go into effect. Everybody scrambled up to the Supreme Court to get emergency relief. Uh, the court granted that, so HB 20 was reblocked. Uh, then we had cert petitions. We had a call for the views of the Solicitor General from the court, which was a way to punt this case from the previous term to this one. Uh, they had Gonzalez versus Google already, the Section 230 case, and I think they'd had enough internet law for one year. Uh, so that delayed things for a year, and then we briefed it, oral argument, here we are. Great. And Ash, you've uh, done a lot of scholarship on First Amendment, you know, tech, uh, how it interacts with regulations of the internet. Do you see any, any precedents or anything you can compare these to, either in the history of the internet or even in the old dead tree media? Um, or do you think these, these are kind of raising a, a completely novel question? Um, both. Yeah. Um, the reality is that the big issue here is what we analogize social media platforms to. Um, the net choice wants to, I think correctly, analogize them to newspapers, and we certainly have precedent going back to the 70s saying newspapers get to decide what to publish. Mm -hmm. And if that analogy holds, then clearly Texas and Florida's laws are unconstitutional, which is my opinion. They want to analogize platforms more to something like a telephone company, what we call a common carrier. I mean, these are entities going back to inns in medieval England that were assumed to have an obligation to serve everyone without discrimination. And if they were common carriers, then in fact, requiring them not to discriminate regarding content would be constitutional. Certainly telephone companies don't choose who their customers are. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, there, there, there are definitely analogies. The difficulty is, of course, when you have a wholly new technology, all analogies are imperfect. Mm -hmm. We're picking between imperfect analogies. I think that the newspaper analogy is the better one because social media companies do not transparently deliver content in the way that telephone companies do. When I pick the phone, what I say goes to the person I'm calling without any interference by, by AT&T. Um, and if that was true of social media, we wouldn't be here. Right? In some ways, I think the, the arguments that Florida and Texas are making are internally contradictory. They're saying you're, you're, we're going to treat you as common carriers because you're not acting as common carriers, because you're not transparently um, moving information. And I, to my mind, that's not right. You can't take away people's First Amendment rights by fiat, which is essentially what I think they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. And that really segues into what I was going to ask Jimmy next, which is, OK, we're going up to the Supreme Court. You're on the litigation team. you know writing the brief that's going to go to the Supreme Court, Justice Elena Kagan has admitted they're not necessarily the nine greatest experts on the internet. In every case, they come to it as generalists. So I'm just curious, whatever you're comfortable saying, what kind of, what do you think about when you're writing a brief on these novel questions for the Supreme Court? What, what sort of big ideas do you want them to come away from? And how do you think about what to focus on and how to make it sort of easily comprehensible to justices of various backgrounds? Yeah, so I certainly think it helps that, you know, they had internet cases last term, right? So they had Section 230, they had uh, Tom now. And so, you know, they're already grappling with some of these issues. And obviously, Justice Thomas has written about Section 230 and how it applies to websites like Facebook, et cetera, a while ago. <clears throat> but, you know, I think what was helpful was to focus on, like, general broad principles, right? And, and like, you know, the through line in all this 
Supreme Court cases and the First Amendment is, you know, you can't like, you can't try to, the government can't try to, you know, bolster the voices of some by, you know, suppressing, you know, the, the speech of others. And like at bottom, that's, that's, I think what's going on here, right? It's, you know, they're, they're trying to tell, you know, social media platforms, you have to carry speech in order to bolster speech that might not otherwise be as prominently disseminated. Um, and so, you know, focusing on those broad themes and analogizing um, to newspapers and, and things of that nature, I think was yeah. pretty helpful. And that, that principle of you can't suppress some to boost others, that goes back to the pre-internet age, the, the Buckley versus Vallejo, exactly. the famous uh, campaign finance case, which, you know, the justices might be more comfortable <laughs> living in that realm. Um, Corbin, Tech Freedom filed an amicus brief supporting that choice. Can you tell us sort of what was the, the argument you pressed there and what was your thinking about how to supplement and, and complement the arguments Net Choice was making in their brief? Sure, yes. So although the oral argument was a mixed bag in some ways, it was a very good day for Tech Freedom because our brief focused on the common carrier theory. And <clears throat> if you eliminate what lawyers were saying at the judge and just look at what the justices were saying, I think there was no appetite for the common carrier theory on the bench, even Justice Thomas, who this has been sort of his hobby horse to suggest that this uh, regime might apply to social media platforms. He didn't really raise it. Um, our brief got into the fundamental uh, sort of non sequitur of taking this area of common law that, as Osh mentioned, goes back centuries to the uh, novel many-to-many -many communication of social media. Uh, social media is inherently an edited product. It is inherently a public product where people are all talking and we can all see what's being said. And those really take it out of this, this common carrier paradigm. And that was our, our focus. Um, common carriage law, if you dig back and look, you know, it grew out of carrying stuff. You know, the classic example, of course, is a railroad, you know, ship and box of pairs, you know, across state lines somewhere. And um, the rules say, you know, you can't discriminate among your customers when you're just carrying these commodity products. That's not what uh, speech is here. Well, and I should add, you know, it was extended m modestly to telegrams and the telephone. You're still talking about private communication. So you basically have what you might think of as sort of widgets of private information being shipped along the dumb pipes. And so it is still somewhat analogous to that original example. Uh, what you had in the Fifth Circuit was one judge, uh, Judge Andy Oldham, not speaking for the court, really extending this out. And I wouldn't be surprised if a, a lot of people in the audience have read A Matter of Interpretation, you know, Antonin Scalia's book. And he notes that in our modern democracy, common law judging, there's a really uncomfortable relationship between unelected judges expanding common law concepts when we are in a democracy and we pass laws by statute and we have the Constitution. So what you really had was a judge stretching this common law concept to constrict the First Amendment. And um, I think it came out at argument the justices kind of recognize that this doesn't make any sense. At one point, one of the attorneys raised common carrier law to uh, Justice Barrett, and she immediately said, well, just put that aside and then answer my question without that there. Um, it wasn't framed very coherently by counsel, to be perfectly honest. I thought the Solicitor General of Texas wasn't winning anyone over by saying the common carrier rules are a compass. You know, a compass to what? Um, <laughs> And so, you know, to end on a slightly sour note, that doesn't win you the case. I've heard people going around saying, well, if, if they're not common carriers, Texas loses. We know that's not the case. The Fifth Circuit ruled without common carrier. Oldham was alone. It was Judge Jones and Judge Oldham together um, basically ruling the wrong way in the battle of analogies that Osh was mentioning earlier. But it's a good sign that the justices recognize that this is just sort of an unnecessary epicycle that we can just put to one side. And, not think about further. Yeah. Um, Ash, you've, you've written a lot of scholarship on these issues. You know, we don't want uh, every stage here to just be an echo chamber. I'm curious, is there anything, uh, are there any arguments made by either Net Choice or supporters <coughs> of Net Choice where you maybe wouldn't go quite as far as them? Or do you think there could be some, some closer questions, if not in this case, in, in 
perhaps related future cases? Yeah, so I, I think net choice seemed to be going as far as to say that essentially all functions of these companies, including say Gmail, are immune from, from common carrier classification and or DM systems, um, systems and therefore any sort of editorial control that they want to exercise, they can. I don't agree. Um, and I would add the United States, the Solicitor General did not agree with that position. I think that, I think that Gmail is different because it is transparent by and large. I think direct messaging is different. It's private, it's transparent. Um, it fits much more the common carrier model. And, but I think that's not what Texas cares about. After all, GM is not, the, Gmail is not kicking people off its system, right? I mean, it's, that's not a thing. Um, and so kind of, there was a lot of hiding the ball and sort of moving, sort of, you know, moving around stuff. The big question here is social media platforms as we traditionally understand them. That is all that Texas and Florida was really focused on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there, I do agree with that choice. I think they're right. But for example, Justice Kavanaugh has taken the position that even ISPs, like the, your internet service provider cannot be regulated as a common carrier. Um, there was a very funny back and forth during oral argument about that. I disagree with Justice Kavanaugh on that. I think it can be. I, mean, I think it's possible for you to take, when to take middle positions and still think Texas and Florida made a mistake here. Yeah, really quick, Tommy. Yeah. HB 20 has an email provision. We all forgot about it because nobody challenged it. Uh, and Minus it's just which state that is? Sitting around, that's Texas. Yeah. Um, and so I just wanted to flag Nobody brought that up at argument, yeah. so I don't know. Huh. We'll see what happens with that. So we have the briefing is submitted in the case, and then Jimmy, obviously you, uh, you work at Clement and Murphy. You uh, were on the <coughs> core litigation team helping to prepare Paul Clement to present oral argument. What, what goes into the preparing for an oral argument, and how is it distinct from briefing? Um, how, uh, what's distinct in the way you present arguments? Do you think about responding to arguments in the brief that you want to, didn't get a chance to on, on paper? And, and what is that process like as part of a team where one person <clears throat> argues it, but the whole team has to uh, help that person be as prepared as possible? So a lot goes into it. I mean, we hold moot courts. Uh, I think we held four in this case, which is, which is a lot. Um, and you know, it's just a, it's usually nice to get people who are fresh to the case, ask questions, you know, as you know, the justices might ask, and uh, you know, like just that iterative process, I think, is you know helpful in sort of refining your answers and uh, and getting to the core themes that you want to highlight at argument, and so it's it's a lot of fun. But. Yeah, and and what what do you think is the key difference between maybe how you would present an argument in a brief versus in person, and you know, orally? Well, I think at oral argument, like you know. A lot of the stuff that gets discussed in the brief just doesn't come up, mm -hmm. and it sort of gets distilled into, I think, you know, what are sort of the key sticking points that, you know, some people might might hang on when they question your position or the other side's position. And so, you know, it's a really, really an opportunity to sort of address like all the, you know, the key just nuances that, you know, might not always get explored in, in briefing. Yeah. So we have had oral argument two days ago. I was there uh, in the courtroom. It was a, quite a marathon, as some people have said, for, for almost a full four hours. Um, I guess we'll just start with Corbin. What surprised you the most? We've had we had so much, you know, writings about this scholarship and Minkus briefs, and yet you still can't always predict what the judges are justices are going to say. Yeah, so you get all the merits briefing, you get all the amicus briefs. You, you, I don't think I answered your question of what are you looking to do as an amicus, and one, one thing that's very helpful is you can take an issue that maybe um, all, the Merits Council only has time to do a little bit and really expand on it, so you know, we expand on common carrier law. And then you get to oral argument, and things just fly in from left field. You never know what you're gonna get suddenly. It's, well, what about Uber? Um, last term in Gonzalez versus Google, we were talking about thumbnails for some reason. You just never know what's gonna come in. Sir, this is a Wendy's. Mm -hmm. Who saw that coming into the argument? Um, so the surprises to me were very much the issues that the justices fixated on that I see as very extraneous to um, the, the merits of this case. You know, we did all that briefing in Gonzalez versus Google on Section 230. They punted, and now Justice Gorsuch is super interested in doing, like, a revolutionary Section 230 opinion. Mm -hmm. um, 
the facial challenge that's in uh, Texas's brief, um, they kind of focused on it more. Florida didn't talk about it much. And suddenly the whole issue is, well, is the facial challenge appropriate for Florida's law? And that becomes a huge thing, which I can dive into separately if you want. Um, the notion that uh, we should be diving into those things instead of just looking at what the 11th Circuit cleanly ruled, um, that was surprising to me. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Ash, what, what, what were your takeaway? What surprised you? <clears throat> the focus on procedure and facial challenges surprised me. I yeah. felt a little bit like it was coming out of left field, I agree. That's not the way the cases were litigated. Um, and it's, I think the whole body of law that the court justices were talking about is so deeply confused that it doesn't, it didn't really advance the ball. But what surprised me a little bit was that the justices were having a hard time really focusing in on what the real issue here is, which is user-generated content. I mean, they were talking about you know, whether or not Uber would be able to discriminate in picking who their customers were. That's not the issue here. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if we're talking about, for example, requiring Uber to be content uh, viewpoint neutral, as Texas might if it covered Uber, the question is whether someone's allowed to leave a racist comment about a driver. That's what Uber doesn't want, and the question is, should should they be forced to permit racist comments? And that, that distinction between discriminating against people, which nobody supports, and discriminating against racist content, which I think most social media companies don't want hate speech on their sites, even though it is constitutionally protected, the justices were confusing that in ways that I found surprising and a little distressing, I have mm. to say. Mm -hmm. Jimmy, I won't presume anything surprised you after four <laughs> moots. I know nothing has ever surprised Paul Clement at the Supreme Court, or if, if it has, he wouldn't know, because he's always uh, so smooth. So just what, what was your reaction to uh, oral argument, either as it was happening or now uh, with a couple days distance? Yeah, um, well, we certainly like, expected some questions about facial as versus as applied, but you know, as Corbin pointed out, the extent of it was, was a little surprising to me. Um, but you know, I thought it was quite telling that, like, the justices that seemed to be the most hostile, like they were focused on procedure and not about like the actual merits. And it seemed like most of them at least agreed, agreed that at least for the core, you know, social media websites like Facebook and, and YouTube and Twitter, X, et cetera, like you can't tell them like what to take down and what to keep up. It's, it's their sort of decision and that's protected by the First Amendment, um, which is I think why like, you know, the ones that were hostile to us focused mostly on procedure rather than anything else. Um, I guess like one thing that was slightly surprising was, you know, a lot of the arguments that got raised in the briefs by Texas and Florida about why like we weren't like newspapers and, you know, the uh, parade in Hurley and the newsletter in PG&E, you know, they, they made points about misattribution, concerns about misattribution and space constraints. Like, none of that, like, really got aired that much. And when it did get aired, like, there wasn't a whole ton of pushback. So, you know, like, we feel pretty confident that at least, you know, for the, for the core social media websites, I think, you know, we have, you know, yeah. it's, it, it went pretty well for us there. Um, so let's, get, let's dive in a little deeper, Corbin. You offered it. So this um, debate about facial versus as applied challenge, can you kind of spell out you know, for, uh, in a way that maybe a non-lawyer could at least uh, somewhat grasp, what is the difference between these two? Why were the ju justices so fixated on it? Yes, so I will try not to get too deep into the weeds. I apologize for those of you who aren't lawyers, but this is a big thing that was at the argument, so we have to deal with it. <clears throat> Going to before the lawsuit was filed, uh, James and company had to make a decision of whether to make an as-applied challenge or a facial challenge to this law. Strategically, I think they clearly made the correct decision. If you bring an as-applied challenge, you open yourself up to a lot of difficulty with a motion to dismiss and potentially getting into discovery because the immediate answer to any as-applied challenge is, well, let's poke and prod at you and figure out exactly how your product works and get into the weeds on, on um, very difficult questions, and that bogs everything down. So you want to bring a, a facial challenge, especially in the context of the First Amendment. And the 11th Circuit understood that that made a lot of sense and that that was correct. Um, and then we kind of got lost in a cul-de-sac at the uh, Supreme Court oral argument. And I'll say at the outset, my hunch is they will go back and they will sort of reread the Supreme Court precedent and they will get themselves righted again and this is not gonna derail the appeal. I've now thrown a hostage to fortune, right? Um, 
there was a lot of talk about what's called the Salerno standard. If the law is about boxes of pears um, and consumer protection, facial challenges are very, very hard. Under Salerno, you need to show that the law is unconstitutional in every last application. That's not fun. Um, the, the, the First Amendment facial challenge stuff has been evolving a bit. It, you know, overbreadth used to be this thing where it kind of looked like it's just for if the law applies to me and I admit it's valid to me, but I want to protect other people to avoid chilling speech, so I argue that it's overbroad. We certainly heard Justice Alito in his solo dissent in a decision called Stevens harping on that. The court seems to have drifted away from that. Uh, now, in a decision called Bonta, you have the rule that if there are a substantial number of un unconstitutional applications in relation to the law's legitimate sweep, that's enough to get you a successful facial challenge under the First Amendment. But then we run into the complication that this is a very uh, broad and some might say sloppy law in Florida. So then does that run you back to Stevens where they said, look, if we don't understand the sweep of the law, how do we figure out what the legitimate scope is? And if it's a state law, do we have to go to the state Supreme Court to get them to interpret the law? Uh, so that's a pitfall. It, it Really, this stuff will start getting you very turned around. But what I think is key here, again, it's a First Amendment case. Uh, Clement brought up a case called Minneapolis Star. And I do think there's sort of a, a special solicitude to facial challenges that try to suppress speech, and in particular in this case, that aim at speakers. Um, NetChoice tried to bring uh, an issue of speaker discrimination before the court, and the court didn't express much interest in, in deciding that issue, and it can open up cans of worms. But in Minneapolis Star, we had a law that said, we're, you know, we're gonna apply a use tax on ink and paper on a select set of big newspapers, and the, they weren't happy with that, the Supreme Court. They struck it down as a speaker-based discrimination. They relied on a decision called Gross John, which was a similar tax on newspapers where the governor had said, you know, I'm gonna go after the lying newspapers. It's very clear what's happening here. If, I mean, if you look at SB 7072, it still does say in the law, notwithstanding that the politicians didn't put sort of their worst animus in there, it says, these platforms have been acting in bad faith, and that's why we're going to regulate them. Um, I don't know how coherent much of what I said is to somebody who's not steeped in this stuff, but the long story short is I don't think they're going to have a problem saying, in this instance, with this sloppy law that we're not sure what's going on, we're happy to uphold this preliminary injunction because you've gone after speech and you've done it in this sort of blunderbuss fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Asha, anything to add on that? Yeah, I, I agree completely. And I think actually it's fairly straightforward if they want to do it. I mean, honestly, this facial versus as applied stuff, the court doesn't do, use, use these rules in any level of consistency. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it often manipulates them to choose what issues to reach, what not to reach. I agree. I think it was telling that Justices Thomas and Alito were so focused on procedure because I think they realized they, they lost on the merits. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that hard to write an opinion that says, with respect to the core content moderation policies of the core social media platforms, what you're really worried about, which is X, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, First Amendment does not permit you to interfere with their content moderation because they have a First Amendment right, um, I think under the press clause, not the speech clause, strange that that never came up, mm -hmm. um, to choose what content to, to have. And as for the rest, I'm gonna remand to you lower courts and you guys figure out if this law reaches Gmail. And if it does, you guys figure out if Gmail actually has First Amendment rights. None of this has been litigated yet. Let's just, case isn't over. This is just a preliminary injunction. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of time to work out the details, but on the core issues where we need to have clear rules because lack of clarity is a problem with free speech. It causes what's called chilling effects, which is people get worried about doing things that are gonna get them into trouble. Florida in particular has authorized massive fines mm -hmm. um, that anyone can sue to bring, to, to get. Um, I think it, it behooves the court to provide clarity on those core issues because they're important. Yeah, and that's a great point on the, on the chilling effect and the potential fines. Jimmy, do you wanna talk a bit about sort of this, the immediate stakes of this case? The court is weighing, you know, keep this injunction in place I mean, what would what would potentially happen if they said, "Let's start, let's relitigate it at some point," and while you're doing that, let's let the whole law 
be in place. I mean, that would kind of be uncharted territory, right? Yeah, and, and I think like it would pose incredible challenges to my clients' businesses, and they would, I think like, you know, you heard that argument, Texas included a provision in its law that said you can't discriminate against Texans, mm -hmm. and that was there essentially to prevent like, you know, Facebook or YouTube from saying we're gonna withdraw from the state if, if this law goes into effect. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like, it'd be extremely challenging to apply, and, and you know, like, I, I, just, I don't know if it's feasible. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to start t doing toss-ups because I don't want us to just be uh, down the line. So anyone, feel free to weigh in on on some topics that were that I found interesting that were often discussed. There was a lot of discussion about what is the speech, what is the message of um, a social media site. If they block everybody except one person, um, what if people don't know that like a person has been not, uh, blocked from a social media site? Does that mean that they're not sending a coherent message? So what are your all thoughts on? Is are we talking about the speech of the social media platforms, or are we really talking about their editorial freedom, and are those maybe two different or distinct things? So I want to answer that because I, that's kind of what I was hinting at earlier, yeah. is I think they're completely different things. Just as Thomas kept asking, what's the message? But that's, again, this is, the Supreme Court has, for, 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 textual, for a textualist court, it's very weird that they don't read the text of the First Amendment, but they don't. Um, the Supreme Court has forgotten that the First Amendment does not just protect speech, it also protects press freedoms and other freedoms as well. I think the argument for a distinct editorial right, not that you're sending a message, it's just that you don't want to, if you were Ben Franklin, you don't want to print a particular pamphlet that you really find offensive. Um, if you're a printer in the, in the 18th century, that is a distinct right. It is not about expressing yourself. It is about essentially choosing not to, to spread the expression of others. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to have a message, right? It doesn't have to be a coherent message. It's simply, I am f Facebook, and from the beginning, I have not wanted hate speech or nudity on my platform because I have a particular user experience I want to create. I think that is independently protected by the First Amendment, and the, that's one of the great confusions that occurred to me during oral argument, and it shows up in the Fifth Circuit opinion as well, is an a inability to distinguish between that editorial issue and that expressive issue, though I think you or Justice got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think there was a difficulty if you're counsel for Florida, Texas, what I would call the Miami Herald Hurley Pincer Movement. So uh, Miami Herald versus Tornillo involved newspapers and you know, holds you as the newspaper don't have to publish a write-up reply because you have editorial control over your product. And counsel for the states want to say, well, no, 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 you know, the, the platforms aren't nearly that picky. They let a lot of stuff through. They're only moderating a small percentage of the content, and that just runs them right into the Hurley buzzsaw because in Hurley we had a parade. It was a... a Boston St. Patrick's Day Parade, and in the record it was clear they didn't block people. It's actually a slightly sordid case in the sense that uh, the gay rights group that they blocked from marching in the parade was like the only group, it seemed, that had been blocked, which really suggests a sort of discriminatory animus. And say what you will about those bad facts, it led to a very strong holding because the court said, look, a speech product, an expressive product, is not itself a public accommodation, and we're not going to, we're just not going to go there, which I think is smart because you get these extreme hypotheticals about, you know, well, what if you block this sweeping sort of speech or whatever, and then you swing right back around to Miami Herald because the New York Times tomorrow could wake up and say, we're a, we're a GOP broadsheet now. We're mm -hmm. switching our policy. We're blocking all speech that's uh, liberal. And then the next day it could go back and say, no, we're back to what we were before. That's your editorial right. So uh, once you've established that the product is about these editorial choices, it doesn't matter whether it's this really coherent message or whether it's just sort of um, you can come in, you can come in, you can come in and speak, but uh, you know, we reserve the right to block this and that and the other. It, it yeah. Jimmy, any thoughts on that? Yeah, Hur Hurley actually mentioned it, said like, you know, the parade didn't have a particularized message. And the decision to exclude, you know, the, the, the gay lesbian group, like the reason wasn't entirely clear and even the group itself didn't have like a like it's a particularly clear message that I wanted to send by participating in the parade. And the court said, like, none of that, none of that mattered, right? It's 
the whole idea is like you can't be compelled to carry speech or disseminate speech that you don't want to carry. That principle applies regardless of whether you know you're prayed as a particularized message. So yeah. Um, so Texas and, and Florida, they relied on a couple cases, really heavily they relied on the Pruneyard case, uh, that was the focus of our amicus brief here at Cato. You know, uh, us libertarian maximalists, I think Pruneyard was wrongly decided, but even uh, you know, <coughs> that's, that's, overruling it is not on the table here. The question is, is it distinguishable? That was a case essentially where the Supreme Court said it's permissible for California to force public, privately owned open air shopping malls to have a, a kind of be free speech zones to allow pamphleteers and picketers. Um, what were thoughts on uh, how the justices reacted to that argument? Texas and Florida want to say this is like Pruneyard. This is private property, but we just want it to be a free speech zone. I think the justices were correctly dismissive of that argument. Shopping centers are not media. Mm -hmm. Their role is not to disseminate speech. People who run shopping centers do so so that people can shop. It's entirely the analogy between that and a social media platform whose whole job is to disseminate speech strikes me as being honestly nuts. Um, and the Rumsfeld case, the other one they relied on, was written by Chief Justice Roberts, who literally said during oral argument, I don't think Rumsfeld controls, so I think we're good on that too. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> any, th any thoughts on that? Yeah, when you... Um, I snarkily say sometimes, conservatives for prune yard, you know, when I see these sort of people uh, in the red states who um, wave that decision around, I know that we live in weird times. Um, because I, I remember being in law school back in sort of the before four and uh, thinking prune yard was this like awful decision and all of my liberal Berkeley law students were super stoked on it. You know, they were really glad about the sort of uh, everybody gets an equal, equal uh, soapbox um, idea, you know, that line in Buckley versus Vallejo that you alluded to earlier that Kavanaugh brought up, they hated that. Um, and weirdly, things have now flipped. But um, the reality is that the analogies are just very, very poor. We saw Sotomayor bring that up. She said, look, you're not letting people like go in the stores at the Prune Yard Shopping Center. Um, Sotomayor also brought up um, quick diversion of the common carrier thing, but you know, common carriers didn't have to put up with like obnoxious speech. You could kick somebody off the train if they were yelling at patrons some of the stuff you see on social media, that would have been totally fine. Um, so to get Pruneyard or Rumsfeld to look like this case, like to t pick up on Rumsfeld, which is about job recruiters, military job recruiters had to be allowed on law school campuses um, under a law passed by Congress, I won't get into the details, but long story short, to make that case look right here, um, you would need to be saying, no, uh, you can let like neo-Nazis come into the lecture halls. Like you'd have to make this talk right now uh, an open uh, forum where anybody can come up and start shouting whatever they want and they have a legal right to do it. That's what it would take to make Rumsfeld look like this case. Yeah, for sure. Um, pretty soon we're going to move on to this. I want to hone in on predictions and, and thoughts about individual justices. Um, but first, any other any any topics I haven't raised yet that that you all uh, thought were particularly struck you, or that you think people should uh, should focus on if they read the transcript? I think what struck me as being a little surprising was it, 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 Clement eventually got to it, but we have to understand, especially with the Texas statute. Literally, if, if a platform cannot <clears throat> discriminate based on viewpoint, if they allow sort of suicide safety posts on, they have to allow posts that encourage suicide on their platform. Mm -hmm. That's nuts, right? That's crazy. Um, and that, that's actually what, I mean, they, if they're going to allow anti-terrorism speech on, they have to allow terrorist propaganda on, so long as it doesn't cross some, the legal line, which is very far. Again. Is that really, does that make any sense? Um, I was surprised at how little conversation there was about those fairly extreme scenarios that are actually what we're talking about. Yeah, Kagan got Texas's Solicitor General to basically admit that at one point. Yeah, about, but- like, Pro-Al-Qaeda, anti-Al-Qaeda. I was surprised half the, con the, I mean, of the four hours, that was five minutes, right? Yeah. I, it should have been at least an hour because that's what we're talking about. Yeah, it came up um, under the Texas law, pro-terrorist speech, how does that get categorized under this viewpoint neutral law? And Texas's solicitor general said, well, it depends on how you categorize it. 
It's like, well, <laughs> that's the question in every single content moderation decision. That means your law like, is incoherent. Like, um, viewpoint neutrality, Texas doesn't actually know what that means in application. Any more than Florida has any idea what consistency, that's a requirement in the Florida law. They don't actually know what that means. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah in the Florida case, like, you know, we raised the example in our opening brief that the consistency provision would apparently require us to post, you know, pro Al Qaeda speech if we like take down like anti or yeah, if we take down if we post pro, uh, anti Al Qaeda speech, you have to also post pro Al Qaeda speech. Yep. And then in their response to Florida was like, no, that's actually not what the consistency provision means. You can have anti like you know terror terrorism policy, but like that just means. If you if you take down like pro Al Qaeda speech, you can't take down like pro ISIS speech. So it's just like it was it was yeah it's it's I think yeah you're right like they don't they really know exactly the right they don't know exactly what the consistency provision requires and you know if you think about it like what does consistent manner mean it's not it's yeah. not entirely clear we had a vagueness argument below it wasn't at the core but um, you know that's another way to go at it. And that's another thing I would mention is just that a lot of the conversation, we were, try, we're treating the Texas and Florida laws as sort of the same. They're not. Um, the Texas law is very clear. I just think it's just unconstitutional. I, to this day, don't fully understand what Florida was trying to do. Mm. Like the special preference for politicians, what, what's that about, right? Why do politicians have greater free speech rights than the rest of us? Um, the special preference for journalistic enterprises. In this world, what is a journalistic enterprise? I mean, they have a definition, but it strikes me as being Extremely very broad. odd in, yeah. this, in, yeah. mo in the modern world when kind of the concept of journalism has become so amorphous. Um, so mush, I think the Florida law is mush, the Texas law is unconstitutional quite clearly. Yeah, yeah. that's a great Judge example. Newsom in Lenin Circuit pointed out that like Pornhub would qualify as a journalistic enterprise. Yeah, you just have to be popular right. or make a lot of yeah. content. Yeah. yeah, and so like, so like under the Florida's law, YouTube kids would have to carry Pornhub content, which is just like, you know, that that's insane. That's a great point. So. Um, you know, Jimmy, you had a front row front row seat. You're you're listening to it live. Any any moments that stuck out? Favorite favorite moments? Moments where you're like, yes, I'm so glad that went perfectly for us, or just things that that were particularly memorable for you. Uh, so I loved when my old boss quoted, you know, Buckley versus Vallejo, yeah. right? Said, you know, the most famous line in First Amendment history is you can't, uh, you know, su suppress the speech of some in order to enhance the relative voice of others. Um, you know, I loved when he just read from Tornillo because a lot of these same arguments were aired there, right? Like, you know, the idea that the Miami Herald had a monopoly on in the local market and, you know, they were biased and stuff like that. Like, those are all reasons given for why, you know, Florida needed this right of reply statute that would have given politicians a right to respond to critical commentary in the Miami Herald about them. And it's like the same arguments that are being raised here, right? It's like, you know, Facebook and YouTube are biased. They, they're a monopoly. They control, you know, vast amounts of speech that's being disseminated. And that's the reason why we need to tell them to carry speech they don't want to carry. It's the same exact arguments that's being aired 50 years later. Yeah. It's often said that sometimes the justices are really talking to each other more than to the yeah. to the advocates, and that was a clear case. I, w I was uh, sitting in the audience, and when Justice Alito said he thought it was Orwellian to call censorship content moderation, I saw Justice Kavanaugh got a big smile on his face. He started chatting with Justice Kagan, and I think he started planning out what he was going to say and basically yeah. have this long rebuttal to Alito saying Orwellian is about government power. It's not That was a, a great peroration, he said. Uh, I think of Orwellian, I think of government power, not private power. Uh, Orwellian is when a country takes over the media, like has happened in other countries. Like let's put aside our like first world problems. I got my tweet you know, blocked and think about North Korea for a second. North Korea is Orwellian. And he said the first amendment is a decision by us that we are not going to be that country. It is a decision we made, and that's been our policy since the beginning. So I recommend going back and actually reading what he said in the transcript. Yeah. Um, so, you know, key leaf reading is always, always difficult. Um, any, reaction, any surprises about what was said by a particular justice where you thought they might be more or less sympathetic to net choice? Um, I will just dive in and say I've, I've been trying to game this out. <clears throat> Um, once again, Justice Jackson was a bit surprising, although not nearly as much so, because after she took the sort of 
MAGA adjacent line with Section 230 and Gonzalez versus Google, we, we now, okay, now we know to expect that she might be a wild card. Um, so she didn't, she seemed really in, in play. Um, but beyond that, not too many surprises. I think you knew where Justice Kavanaugh was coming because he's already said his opinions and they match ruling for net choice. And there were no surprises there. If anything, the surprise was just how strongly he uh, articulated his views at oral argument, which I thought was fantastic. Uh, Roberts, um, as we know from him rejecting Rumsfeld versus Fair being applied here, you know, he tends to keep his cards close at argument, but I, I don't see him ruling against net choice here. Justice Barrett, I think at one point basically said, well, this case is more analogous to Miami Herald versus Tornillo. She's been a pretty cautious minimalist since she's been on the court, and the cautious minimalist approach here is not to blow up the internet. Um, suffice it to say that Andy Oldham in the Fifth Circuit did not take the cautious minimalist approach. Um, and then Sotomayor and Kagan, I think, were very alive to how broad these laws are, how insane they are in the ways that Osh was pointing out. There's five votes. Um, so I still expect net choice to uh, get a favorable ruling here. Um, I don't think there was any reason to expect that Thomas or Alito will do anything different from the signals they've already given us. If anything, Alito signaled that he, he doesn't understand how content moderation really works. Um, he doesn't understand that content moderation is X doing a better job than it's currently doing of having like boobs in bio not appear at the bottom of every tweet I do. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, maybe it's 5-4, maybe Jackson joins the majority at 6-3, but uh, you wanted tea leaf reading, yeah, there's my, uh, man, I'm throwing hostages to fortune left and right here, but that's how I read it. That's awesome. awesome. I agree. Um, I, Jackson was really surprised me. Yeah. Her focus on the, the, on the procedural issues, the as applied versus facial, um, was, I mean, it's sort of, not really the big question in this case. It was a little surprising, but uh, yeah, I think Net Choice has five votes. The only the interesting question for me is how broad or narrow an opinion comes out. And I think it could easily be a fairly narrow opinion that just focuses on content moderation by what are clearly social media platforms and leaves the Ubers and the Etsy's of the world for another day. Um, and I think that I could see Barrett sort of insisting on that. Um, because of her minimalism, and I think that's not a bad result, honestly. Yeah. Jimmy, anything you're willing to say? I <laughs> uh, hope it's 9-0. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love the optimism. Good, good, good. All right. uh, unfortunately, if it's 9-0, that probably means it's some kind of punt. <laughs> oh. uh, sad but true. All right, I want to remind our online audience we're going to be moving to uh, audience questions now. Uh, the online audience can join the conversation, submit questions directly on the event webpage that's on our Cato page, on Facebook uh, comments, on YouTube comments, or on X using hashtag Cato1A, C-A-T-O, numeral one, letter A. Um, we've got a couple of, I'll start with an online question here, and then we'll try to alternate back and forth online and uh, in person. Uh, so we have one that says, if Texas and Florida win, then would SNSs, maybe it means social media sites, I'm not sure, or others, execute a domain block to shut down access to their servers' data centers? I'm not sure about geofencing. So this is, uh, take that question however you like. There were questions about would, you know, Facebook just block every user in Texas and Florida? Could they do that? Would that violate the law? Any thoughts on if that's feasible or legal? So I'm actually going to ask Jimmy to answer that because I'm curious, this whole don't discriminate against Texans, don't, don't mix with Texas, I guess, as a, you know, what, what do they say that provision means and what do you guys believe it means? Well, it, it was interesting to hear at oral argument the Solicitor General for Texas sort of back away from, from that reading of, of the don't discriminate against Texans provision and it wasn't really entirely clear on, on what his answer was. It's, it seemed to, he seemed to say like, you could you could withdraw from Texas if you wanted to, but honestly, it was entirely clear. Um, yeah, he tried to hide a, a behind personal jurisdiction, which was very unsatisfying. And as right. I recall, yeah. a justice did press him to say, no, no, under the law, and then he made a, a quick retreat. Yeah, and I think there have been cases where, like, you know, Facebook has been sued in Texas, and Texas has said, like, we do have personal jurisdiction over you. So, I mean, that was... A little so inconsistent with that. We're getting into the weeds here a little bit. To clarify, 
Could the social media companies geofence Florida? Legally, yes. Technically, I'm a lawyer, not a, I don't I mean, that's a, um, right. but there's a real question about whether it would be legal to do so with Texas mm -hmm. because of this provision that says you can't discriminate. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, <clears throat> there's no tech, technical expert on this stage. I will say easier said than done, especially with mobile phones. Um, I will not dive into that further, uh, not being the technical expert, but it, it, Texas Solicitor General made it sound like you can just magically do that, and that, that's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's open it up to the audience. Um, so assuming that choice does get a favorable outcome, um, do you think the analogy of them being a news publisher will be a significant factor? And if it is, um, I'm curious, what does that mean for their 230 protections down the line? Because one of the big arguments, as I understand it, as a non-lawyer um, for 230 is that they're not news publishers, they're a passive platform that's sharing content. I, I think that's actually not right, as the lawyers argued. If they really were a passive um, platform, they wouldn't need 230, right? I mean, telephone companies don't need 230. They're not liable for what's transmitted. Um, 230 exists precisely because they're not passive. And to the contrary, and this, again, this surprised me that Justice Alito wasn't getting this. The purpose of 230 is to encourage content moderation. That's the whole point of the second provision, is to say you can moderate and you're not going to be held liable as long as you act in good faith. So. I think that argument is actually exactly wrong, honestly. I mean, I know it was being made a lot, but it strikes me as being the opposite of what the way we should think about 230. Yeah, I, I actually think it's worth diving into this a little bit further because it's, it's actually pretty pernicious. Um, Justice Gorsuch at one point said, well, doesn't Section 230 kind of make you a common carrier? And there's a lot of confusion over what the word publisher in 230 means. There's two distinct things. And once it's laid out, it's actually not that complicated. You have a First Amendment right to your editorial discretion, and you have a Section 230 protection from liability from most third-party speech that you host. That's it. That's it. It's not like, oh, well, Section 230 uh, makes you not a publisher or like changes the ontology of what you are somehow. Uh, it's just an additional liability protection that is slapped onto your pre-existing First Amendment right. Um, and if that gets mixed up, um, th things could go pear-shaped very quickly. Let me illustrate. Section 230 protects users and providers of an interactive computer service. And Texas, in particular, gets hung up on the provider part and tries to sort of retcon Section 230 as this protection for big platforms. Section 230 protects your Twitter account or X account or whatever we're calling it. So if Section 230 makes an entity protected by it, a common carrier, your Twitter account is a common carrier, and the government can tell you what speech you have to repeat. Um, so when the sort of bizarro world Section 230 points get raised at oral argument, um, you know, saying it doesn't make it so, I really hope they don't go down that route in this case where now, you know, we haven't briefed it and gotten into it. We, all this stuff got raised at the Gonzalez versus Google uh, case, and it seemed like it made the justices back away. Um, so it'd be pretty messed up for them to now turn around and do <coughs> some, some crazy Section 230 opinion. And let me add one more thing. This, I think your question actually illustrates the problem, which is that the problem of analogies, lawyers like analogies. So we're like, think, you know, social media platforms are like newspapers, only for some purposes. Nobody thinks Facebook is a newspaper, right? I mean, there's just, that's, it's a very, very imperfect analogy. I just think in the sense of editorial rights, it's the better analogy. Um, <coughs> not much to add. I guess I'll just say one thing about the intuition that if you are exercising First Amendment rights to publish something or your editorial discretion, then like you should face liability for it. Like I think that's sort of the intuition motivating a lot of the justices. Um, but like historically, that's just not true, right? Because you've always had like newsstands, for example, right? Like you know they carry they carry magazines and newspapers, and they have a First Amendment right to decide like what to put in the first row or what to put in the bottom shelf. But like they've never been, you know, thought of as as liable for for, you know, any defamatory statement that might be in the newspaper. 
right? So like that, I think that sort of intuition doesn't exactly hold, but. Yeah. Uh, we have another online question here. Uh, social media companies have determined they don't want their valuable trademarks associated with disinformation, racist comments, <coughs> etc. Did any of the Amici briefs offer this justification for these private parties to curate the content that is publicly associated with their trademarks? So that's an interesting question because I can see how that argument might be a little bit of a double-edged sword because, of course, social media companies don't want to say they do endorse everything that is on their sites. So any thoughts on that? Well, just to be clear, you don't need that to win, right? Because um, Jimmy brought up the, the PG&E case that was about PG&E, you know, the utility having to put uh, speech that was not its own in its bills that it mailed, mailed out, and nobody was going to go, oh, this is PG&E's speech, or like it's associated. Um, ditto Miami Herald. I mean, nobody was going to be like, this politician ranting in the page is, is, is the Miami Herald. Um, so I guess what I would say is it's probably true they don't want to be associated with it. And that does confirm, it confirms that it's expressive, what's going on. We're angry about all of the content moderation decisions one way or the other because they are expressive editorial choices. But it is not a necessary condition, no. I would add, and because I don't have, you know, I've, I've, I have no relationship with the social media companies, um, it's part of their business model. Um, and and as, if you look at what's happening with X, it's demonstrating this, right? It, they, they rely on advertising. What advertiser wants to p have their ad pop up next to a neo-Nazis post? Mm -hmm. um, and that's important because government laws that threaten the business model of medias of any media worry me a lot, right? I mean, that's the press clause really is about preserving an independent media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just on the misattribution point, like, you know, Corbin is right, like, in Tornillo, nobody would have confused the candidate's reply as the Miami Herald speech. Mm -hmm. And in all sorts of other compelled speech cases, going back to, like, Woolley versus, uh, I forget the, Maynard. Yeah, Maynard, yeah. Woolley versus Maynard, which is the case in New Hampshire about the license plate that says live free or die. Right, like, you know, like, if I posted a bumper sticker that said, you know, uh, peace is great, like, that, I mean, nobody would confuse live free or die as my speech, but that's still, you're still being compelled to carry a message you don't want to carry. And in fact, like, if, if you have to actually affirmatively disassociate yourself from that message, I mean, we think that just, like, doubles the compulsion rather than, it just doubles the First Amendment problem rather than sort of ameliorating it, and the court said that in a variety of different contexts. Yeah, Justice Thomas is on record saying yeah, that justifies yeah. any compelled speech law then. Yeah, yeah. And, and like on the point of misattribution, even if it does matter, I think like, you know, people do associate things that make it through on the websites with like the website's editorial judgment, which is why we have this law in the first place, right? It's like, you know, Florida and Texas are saying the reason why like we need to pass this law is because you're being you know, you're discriminating against conservative content when you decide what to keep up and what to take down. And that just sort of gives the lie to all of their uh, arguments about how, you know, like the speech won't be misattributed to the websites. And one more on that. There's a tie-in here to the Morthy case, which is being argued in a month, in which, in that case, basically, conservative states are arguing that because the Biden administration was yelling at social media platforms to take down vaccine misinformation, during the height of the COVID crisis, that that meant that basically the platforms were being, the actions of the platforms could be attributable to the government and trigger the First Amendment. If platforms really were just like the telephone company, why was Joe Biden yelling at them? Mm -hmm. It's not like Biden was yelling at, at telephone companies, right? I mean, the, the facts of Morthy show that we absolutely hold platforms liable to some extent for failing to block harmful content. I mean, that's what, that case is about. That's a great point. Might have time for one quick, very quick question. Uh, I don't know if it's quick, so I apologize. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, the states seem to argue, or I seem to hear that there is some sort of exception in their laws about moderating content that's, that fit into the Section 230 C2A categories of obscene, lewd, levitious. Uh, did I hear that right? Um, is there any basis in the statutes for that type of exception for those types of categories? I didn't see one, so. So this was another cul-de-sac during oral argument. Yeah, the, the Texas law definitely, um, I think the Florida law, although Jimmy can correct me, uh, say, you know, you can do any content moderation that is consistent with federal law. 
And what I was kind of going bonkers about during the oral argument is you can't pass a blatantly unconstitutional, you know, First Amendment violating law and then stick in like a preemption provision and then be like, ha ha, our law is constitutional because it actually doesn't do anything because Section 230 blocks it. Um, because Congress can't narrow First Amendment rights, right? Like Congress can't pass a law that narrows the First Amendment. So sticks, sticking Section 230, you know, hypothetically, Congress could then like repeal Section 230 and your law would spring back to life. Um, and it was, it was a little annoying to be arguing over what is the preemptive scope of Section 230. And I should add, by the way, if Texas won this case, they would then turn around and argue for like the narrowest possible interpretation of Section 230. They'd probably even say it's unconstitutional. Um, so I, I wish we hadn't even gone down that. I think it's totally irrelevant, uh, but there's my take on it, Neil. All right, well, uh, we're going to have to sadly end it there, but let's all give a big hand to our fantastic panel. Uh, for our online audience, we're going to now take a 10-minute break, so the stream will resume at 10.35. Uh, and for all of you uh, here as well, uh, we're going to be starting back up with uh, how the net choice cases may impact content moderation, moderated by my colleague David and Sarah, who's a fellow here for Free Expression and Technology. Uh, there's restrooms on this floor and larger ones, one floor up and one f floor down, and refreshments out in the lobby. Thank you all.
best part. Because everyone? All, all right. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for those who might be joining us online and those who have stuck around um, from the prior panel. Um, glad that you can be joining us here today um, for this panel. We just heard a panel that discussed um, sort of the, the oral arguments and the legal arguments that were made before the Supreme Court in the net choice cases on Monday. This panel will be discussing the practical realities, how these laws and these types of laws may impact platforms, content moderation, and the business models um, of social media and other companies. By way of introduction, my name is David and Sarah. Um, I'm a fellow for free expression and technology here at the Cato Institute. And I'm super happy to be joined here by my two friends. And let me just quickly introduce them and then we will get into our, our discussion. To my left, we have Ash Kazarian. She manages and develops policy projects on free expression, content moderation, surveillance reform, and the intersection of constitutional rights and technology at uh, Stand Together. And prior to her role at Stand Together, she was with uh, me actually at uh, Meta, where she worked as a content policy manager on content regulation. Facebook. I'm going to still call it Facebook. Still going to call it Facebook? Yeah. <laughs> Formerly known as. Uh, <laughs> And then uh, on the far left, we have Nathan Linfors, who is the policy director at Engine Advocacy and Foundation, where he leads the organization's research efforts on, on AI competition, privacy, and international trade portfolios. Previously, he held other roles at Engine, including managing the organization's uh, network of thousands of startups and advocates. Um, they also have a really cool moderator mayhem game, which I <laughs> recommend you all check out if you want to look in how difficult um, it can be to moderate content live, so I recommend you check that out. But with that, let's get into a, our discussion. Uh, and I guess I'll start, we just heard this great panel talking about the, the legalities of, of, of what the Texas and the Florida laws. But as a segue to our panel, I wanted to ask both of you, how do you think the court grappled with the practical and technical aspects of content moderation presented in, this, in these cases? We heard some interesting questions, my favorite being whether or not notorious Protestants could be kept off of Catholic <laughs> websites. Um, but there was a variety of them, so I'm curious what you're, how you thought the court grappled with those questions. To quote Justice Sotomayor from 2023, she said, these are not like the nine greatest experts on the internet. And I think, thankfully, they are self-aware, so that's a start. Also, are people hearing an echo? No? Okay, good. You know, we're still all grappling with technology in different ways. But yes, I think, I think the justices um, are still trying to figure out different features and how they apply and if it's speech or conduct on, on different little parts, right? Uh, there was a moment where I don't remember which justice said, well, there's no comments on Venmo. And I like screamed out loud, there is. There are comments on Venmo. And they're also like, they're practical things where, you know, they kept talking about Uber. If you think of it, I'm guessing a lot of people have Uber on their on their phones. There is an image you usually they encourage you to upload your photo. Um, if you upload uh, an image of swastika as instead of your photo, I'm pretty sure Uber is going to exercise some content moderation. So there are like a lot of little situations which they obviously didn't get to. Um, but honestly, it wasn't as bad as could have been justices were on it. Yeah, um, Yeah. Th great question. And uh, let me just start by, by thanking you and, and Cato for being here. It's always great to be here, especially when you're uh, serving lunch. Um, <laughs> stick around, yeah. Yeah, stick around for lunch. There's another panel after us, and then, then they'll feed you real. Um, yeah, I think um, to, to Ash's points, you know, it's, it's something of a mixed bag, right? Um, I think there were definite, definite bright spots, right? So you had Sotomayor asking about Etsy and how they're going to you know, curate the service that they want. Um, you also had uh, you know, a lot of that you know, expected, perhaps, at least what, what we thought might be a lot of, and you heard it in the, in the first panel, the core of these cases about content moderation, right? But it was a lot of procedural um, uh, discussion. Um, and so I think that that's good. I throw that in the mixed bag. The other thing is is you have, um, you know, Justice Alito just, you know, dismissing what content moderation is um, as some sort of euphemism for censorship. And obviously that's um, 
wrong, but um, not unexpected. Um, and then, then one of my favorite, uh, you know, this wasn't to the content moderation uh, aspect necessarily, but um, ra rather around transpar transparency and disclosure provisions, but him pointing to the European mm -hmm. Digital Services Act and saying, you know, you do it over there, um, why can't you do it here? Well, there are lots of relevant differences, and um, Paul Clement pointed that out. Um, but also, you know, Europe does not have the First Amendment, nor do they, um, you know, does the DSA on the whole very uh, favorable to, to, to speech or, or companies um, uh, in, in those ways. So I'll stop there, but those are my initial takeaways. Initial thoughts, yeah. And can both of you address how the policies in Texas and Florida would impact social media's content moderation, the core of this issue? And we know that these there are some commonalities between these laws, but as the last panel discussed, there are also some differences. So we, can you describe how these laws would impact just the operations that, that these businesses are trying to run, the content moderation they're trying to provide? The true answer is no one knows, right? <laughs> and we saw that both Solicitor General of Texas and Solicitor General of Florida don't know themselves. Um, so I, the answer would be there would be a lot of billable hours for a lot of lawyers. Um, a lot of new policy people would be hired by tech companies to try and figure this out. Um, we can guess on the margins. So let's say on Texas, you would want to either sanitize uh, the user experience as much as you want. My pitch that no one loved, especially legal, was that we just stop moderating altogether and we have... Um, like a disclosure that says you're seeing this because Governor Abbott signed HB 20 into law. Uh, just, just make it all like one big public forum like they wanted it to really be. Um, but o overall, it would be just constantly adjusting, seeing lawsuits come in, adjusting again. And, you know, we've, we've been talking about this a lot. I'm sure everyone in this audience have heard have heard a lot of the sky is falling conversations around the net choice cases. But the reality would be your user experience will slowly but surely start getting worse. And it would be a sort of twilight zone where you wouldn't know what's happening, but it would be just that the walls are going to start closing in and it would just be like less speech and less speech until I guess all is left is puppies. I was going to say, <laughs> I was going to say, because you, you, you you I claim the, the puppies. You claim because on one hand yeah. you have the yeah free for all, anything goes. But then you the other alternative is it's slowly but surely sanitized to puppies and kittens, which itself raises a question about whether that is a viewpoint being pro puppy or pro kitten. So we won't. America would go to civil war over that question. <laughs> Probably would. Uh, Ethan, your thoughts? I have noted down to let Ash go first on this question to say the puppy <laughs> remark. Um, but I think you know, to the question, um, you, you heard, heard it laid out by Ash, you heard it laid out in oral argument, these t services would become inevitable hogwash um, very quickly. How are you going to find anything that you want to see? Are you going to continue to engage with a bunch of things, useless spam, what have you? Um, and so these laws are really about the ability of services to you know, moderate content on their services in the way they see fit. Um, that's, of course, uh, you know, direct conflict with uh, First Amendment precedents, right, permitting private entities to access, exercise that editorial discretion. I would have. Um, on, on, and what information to present or not, right? So you're allowed to remove uh, the material that might be harmful, unsavory. Um, if you're a kitten-only platform, you can remove puppies or, or vice versa. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's like a Reddit page like to that exact point. Um, and one example I think the, the last uh, panel brought up is like if, you're, um, if you don't want to have um, anti-Semitic speech, then you can't have pro-Semitic speech. You heard that, that raised it um, at oral argument. I think for, for companies, and especially we can get into this in a bit, for ones that aren't the you know, kind of prototypical, I guess they call them classic social media services, the ones that are you know, in the, the applicability thresholds of these laws, but you set those aside for a second to think about the real practical problems this creates for businesses, um, because content moderation is how you build a unique business, right? Sotomayor is getting at this with, with the Etsy point. Um, and I think this is even more true for startups, especially for the startups that, that we work with, 
they're trying to carve out a niche because they aren't going to go and create the next uh, meta, Facebook, YouTube, what have you. They might be able to carve out a space. You know, we're a professional development platform for teachers or, or something like this um, as one example. I think the example we used in, in our brief was uh, a phishing site. doesn't want anything but, but phishing content. And I, I really don't know why we use that, other than to maybe appeal to some avid fishermen that, that might be on the court and might be uh, that that argument might appeal to. But you know, in in that hypothetical service, let's say you know fishers, you know, spelled in the true startup fashion without any vowels, <laughs> um, you know, you don't want to show hunting content because your users are only expecting fishing content, um, and so you're going to take um, things that that users aren't expecting to see and don't want to see off of that site, and, and these laws would prevent that. And the Texas Solicitor General also, during their arguments, said, well, these companies can geofence anything. They can geofence a building, let alone a state, uh, which is in contrast with the provision saying you can't leave Texas. Um, so I wonder if now, let's say, all goes you know awry and the law goes into effect, he said we can leave Texas. Uh, we. Um, he <laughs> said social media companies can leave Texas. Let's just all leave. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I want to uh, pick up on that, the, like the technical aspect. I know the last panel got at this a, a, a bit with uh, a question from the audience. And I know that there's more um, technologists in here, more qualified technologists than I am. But, but from speaking to startups that uh, think about geofencing, can you geofence a state? Can you meaningfully exclude users from a state? And they're thinking about this, usually not in, in speech context, but in where we have other patchworks around like data privacy, for example. Folks, they, don't, they aren't able to reasonably exclude users, for example, from California. So what they do is they just don't advertise in that state. Well, that, you know, obviously under these laws, you know, the, thresh the applicability thresholds are so high, maybe the point gets lost. But I think, um, you know, if you imagine a world where this is, passes constitutional muster, a law, a state could pass a law with, with, uh, without, you know, any sort of hundred thousand, hundred million user user threshold, something like this, for these sorts of laws to apply. Um, you can imagine a world where, where, like, the technical feasibility of a startup, for example, to avoid um, users from Texas or or any other hypothetical state. Um, I don't know that that's there. Yeah, and to go beyond just the laws at issue in in this case, because. I think once you see um, you know, if these laws were upheld as constitutional, it's not going to stop at just, you know, just Texas and Florida. We're going to see more states throw their hats in the ring for asking social media companies, requiring social media companies to moderate in, in different fashions because based on their considered judgments. How, how does this open the, the, sort of the legal floodgates for a new environment, a new uh, a new world for these social media companies, and how can they go beyond just these laws, but how do they navigate that of just different states requiring, making demands that are often contradictory, and how do they navigate that? Well, I did say the sky was going to fall, but slowly. If the floodgates are fully open, which I'm really hoping they're not, um, think of any policy issue you're very passionate about, let's say abortion, right, or uh, gun control. And think of the person on the other side of that uh, passing a law saying their speech has to be carried. And we have seen in a post Dobbs world, actually, some states already, I believe it was South Carolina, they attempted to pass a law uh, that would uh, force uh, platforms to carry, to, to not carry anything related to abortion as a topic. Um, they didn't pass it, thankfully, but but in in the world where Florida and Texas are found to be constitutional, let's say I don't want to manifest that, but if they are, um, that happens. We have a full balkanization of the internet, and I guess I moved to Canada or something. True. <laughs> well, they just introduced yesterday in the parliament a uh, a. Uh, I think it's C63, maybe. It's a nice online safety act. So maybe read up on that one first and see if they'll <laughs> pass it. Um, make an informed decision. Um, to the question, I think, you know, I hinted that uh, at, it, at it a little bit. But I think for us as Engine, like, we don't and don't purport to represent any of the largest companies. 
why would we were we we work with a network of of small startups some of them are are just you know a team of a handful of people they might only have a few thousand users so so why do we care about this well i think it's exactly as, as ash said right these laws are about the power of the state to compel a private enterprise private individual um to to speak or to host speech that they don't want to um and if that's okay if that passes constitutional muster then why would that not um, you know, one day apply to a startup? I think for, for us, and the reason we wait in, you know, with, with briefs at, at the Supreme Court and in, in the lower courts was to point this out um, that uh, you know, they don't apply to startups today, but um, you know, the constitutional principle here is, is important. Um, and so I think if you are in a world where this sort of regulation, I think you see a lot of startup activity just go away, right? Mm -hmm. And you're left with the the sorts of of big guys that can figure out or like have the like staying power. You see like the moderation practices of of X um, change, right? And I think that's like a response to to all of this, and we can get into that. But you also see like the staying power of the like the size of the users, obviously. Um, I don't know what the like user metrics are, but like it's still a site that exists, and we're I don't know a year, two years, I don't time is a flat circle on from that, um, and and that's still around. So, um, and then the other thing I, I want to note um, around regulation and these laws, and, and I think you heard it come up at at oral argument, is like, well, if these laws are are um, found, uh, you know, the injunction is upheld, eventually, you know found constitutional, what, uh, what have you, um, uh, then you won't be able to do any sort of uh, tech regulation ever again. And this is like one of the, like the AALP, AELP made this argument in their brief. Um, I think the Solicitor General did like a good job of pushing it back against that um, and highlighted some of the ways that you might think about tech regulation, um, you know, um, outside of like a speech regulation, I don't feel particularly compelled to like repeat all of those because I'm not certain that I agree with or endorse like tech regulation through those methods. But the point is that they exist, right? Um, and they aren't um, infringing on First Amendment rights. It, one of the things that I think both of you have sort of gotten at is that the the very these very laws or the expansion of this principle to other laws would potentially implicate the very sort of speech that is Texas and Florida are trying to protect, whether it's the reduction to puppies and kittens, well, there goes your conservative speech that you're trying to protect. But furthermore, if you allow this to expand to other states, so other states make rules that conservatives won't like. And so the whatever kind of speech you're trying to protect with these laws, these laws are actually sort of counterproductive, either by limiting um, the, the very speeches because the they're trying to avoid liability, or because other states will jump in and the patchwork of regulations will effectively destroy um, the possibility of um, uh, these companies being able to provide those services. But speaking of those, those grievances, people, I'm sure everyone around the room has had a less than positive experience at one point or another with certain social media um, apps and platforms, but social media pla apps and platforms change over time. They provide their users with different services. And I was hoping you guys could provide me with some examples about, yes, we don't necessarily need the government to solve for all these grievances because social media companies are responding to users as users want different products. They want different services. What do we see happening in this space where the social media companies are trying to respond to what their consumers are, are demanding? That's a big question. Overall, it depends on the platform, but mm -hmm. I think a very recent example would be uh, X, formerly known <laughs> as Twitter, um, with Elon Musk self-proclaiming himself to be a First Amendment absolutist. I don't think he knows what that means, but proclaiming that, right? And then um, there was a very, it wasn't super explicit, but it was like an inappropriate AI-generated image on Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift being one of the most powerful people in the world, within like 24 hours, Twitter just stopped allowing searches for Taylor Swift until they like figured out how to like adjust that. And that's just kind of reacting to one case. Mm -hmm. 
um, we have seen platforms adjust their policies across the world depending on elections going on, right, trying to respond to that. They didn't used to do that, and then everyone got yelled at during 2016, and they thought about it more. They talked to a bunch of academics and civil society and human rights advocates, and they adjusted the screws. Um, the algorithms. Uh, so there's always, you know, constant or uh, another bingo that we didn't expect of a Tide Pod challenge being brought up <laughs> on <laughs> during oral arguments. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, uh, TikTok has <laughs> adjusted the algorithms to make sure that when you search for a uh, Tide Pod challenge, you now get uh, people also talking about uh, how maybe don't swallow chemicals. <laughs> Uh, those are just, you know, kind of anecdotal examples, but overall, um, platforms not only want to, but that's economically better for them to listen to their customers and adjust and develop as a society develops. And, you know, we as a society have come a long way. Uh, there are things now that we find more, um, like, widely societally acceptable that we didn't even 20 years ago, and platforms reflect that. Um, that's a great answer. Uh, I think one of the great ironies of like these cases and these laws is like the private sector response in the kind of like aggrieved universe was to create their own platforms, right? So like Truth Social and Truster or whatever. I don't know all of the names of all of the ones, um, but it's hard to imagine them wanting to comply with a law like this, right? You're going to want to have to host pro-Biden speech because you want to have anti-Biden speech, for example, um, right? And so I think one kind of, to your point, highlights that, you know, the <coughs> freedom of enterprise, freedom of speech on the Internet enables folks to create these sorts of services um, and tailor to those sorts of communities. Um, and also why these laws are antithetical to that. And I would say actually with a startup ecosystem, yeah. they are much more um, responsive to the societal shifts, right? So um, if, if these laws exist or even attempts sometimes startups, they don't have the money, they don't have the lawyers, they haven't met a lawyer. Um, they, they are reshifting the focus of how they're developing uh, their business model and their innovation in general based off of the environment they're in, and they're also responding to what um, we as a society want, right? Um, what, what are the need? like in, in 2020 uh, and 2021, during like the most of a lockdown, uh, there are new trends that emerged that affected businesses and business models that didn't exist before. Uh, and so startups are even much more um, nimble, I guess, and responsive to that. Yeah, and I think there's just like a gr that's that's a great point, and maybe I want to um, enhance that and say there's lots of like niche services that don't purport to, and probably maybe even don't want to fill or or serve large audiences, but want to serve their audience really well. And I think I, I mentioned it earlier, but like there are a few startups in our network. And I think it's a, like a good comparative example. Um, they're both professional like development communities. One is for teachers and another is for like health professionals. Mm. But the types of content that they encounter are different as you might expect. And the way they approach moderation is different. Um, and the types of things that they moderate, disallow, um, find unhelpful for, for their community um, are different. Um, and, and so that's, that's, that's one point to be made here. And I just like, there are so many examples of, of startups filling niche roles within kind of the broader, you know, internet speech ecosystem, if you will. Um, I've got, uh, we, three or four, and not just our hypothetical phishing uh, service, but actual companies, three or four of them, we, we allude to or, or point to in our brief, but also ones for social, ac social activism on, on college campuses, which is like uh, uh, universe inside of universe. Um, local events, local reviews, critical thinking, finance, lots more. And so, you know, I think that's that's what kind of this conversation is all about, right? So these are services that are different based on these other communities, um, content they host, and, and importantly, their ability to moderate it. 
brings it all the way back to the notorious Protestants uh, keep <laughs> being left off the, the, the Catholic website, which I, like I said, I enjoyed that. Um, uh, I'll ask the audience one more question, uh, the, the panelists one more question, but I just wanted to encourage the online audience as well that you can submit questions online through the, through the website. So just be feel free to uh, uh, enter questions there. And just the last question, I know this panel isn't dealing with the legalities, but I am curious what your overall thoughts were in, in hearing your arguments. Were you, uh, did you think that the, the justices were, were amenable to the good arguments? Did you think they were accepting bad arguments, especially with a focus on the sort of technical and practical elements? But just what were your overall takeaways and impressions coming away from this? Are you optimistic? Just your thoughts there. You go first. Okay. Um, we'll hit the, the optimism maybe and then the cynicism. <laughs> Um, great question. I think uh, for me, the like you sum it up into three words. Now, caveat this: think what you want of, of uh, Justice Kavanaugh, but by the government, this is what it boils down to. Um, and if there's in a moment that stands out to me that um, was useful and hopefully illuminating to not just everyone in the the courtroom, but especially the justice, the fellow justices on the bench. That's what this is about, right? This is about uh, compelled speech by the government, not um, what what private actors are, are doing among themselves. Um, and so I think uh, the, the previous panel waited out uh, in, 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 a, in a deep dive fashion about where, where fault lines will um, probably ultimately end up. I think I, on the whole, agree with that. We'll see what Ash has to say, but I'm optimistic. I'll start by answering the question about if YouTube was a newspaper, how much it would weigh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I would throw it back to the justice and say, well, if the Federalist, which is online, by the way, if we took the Federalist online and made it a physical piece of paper, how much would it weigh, Your Honor? <laughs> <laughs> um, so having said that, um, the arguments went worse than I thought they were going to go. Like, let's, like, honestly, I thought it was just, I was just saying, it's going to be a clean win, just 9-0, we're in it to win it, the future is here, the Super Bowl, you know, Tom Brady is like going down the line, I guess in that scenario, that's Paul Clement and that choice. Um, but the, obviously no one expected the facial challenge things and we can get into that, but I think what is actually stopping everyone at the, at the goal line is that they are uncomfortable ruling on this like as as a whole, like they, they they seem to be trying to find a line. They went to Solicitor General asking her to give him a line, um, and they did. They punted fully in the Gonzalez and Tomney last year. And my plea is, I guess, uh, my personal plea. I don't know how much Steve would love this. Is stop pushing this down the line. Like the future is here. We have questions about AI coming down. Like we're already trying to grapple with the next digital realm and we need to figure this out. To me, the answer is clear. Uh, to them, it's a little more unclear and maybe genuinely, maybe it's generational. Um, but we've seen this, if you look at the First Amendment cases, right, with, with Tornillo and with Hurley, we've seen these analogies applied to new technologies or situations. It's, we're not living in a world where this hasn't happened before. Just because the scale is different and it's not in the physical world shouldn't change the outcome. So overall, I thought the Florida part was a little shaky, then it got stronger when we got to Texas. Um, but, but yeah, it wasn't, I was like, some people were around me. I was just walking in circles, stress eating. <laughs> um, so it was it wasn't it wasn't as clean of a break as I as I hoped. Uh, but I'm still very optimistic. I, I think it's going to be five four with uh, Justice uh, Brown Jackson writing her own dissent, and then Alito Thomas and Gorsuch writing the dissent together. Um, that's my prediction. It's on the record. Um, <laughs> How narrow it's going to be, we'll see. I'm still hoping for somewhat of a wide answer, just because, as we said, like Uber moderates too, Venmo moderates too. Uh, actually, there is this like great article about this guy in New York who Venmoed his friend, saying beers for ISIS, and then was banned off of Venmo for a long time. Um, this happens, so it, 
Etsy moderates, right? Um, Etsy was a star of a show, of course. Uh, <laughs> my guess is like Justice Kagan and Sotomayor just like love buying some very like <laughs> nerdy stuff on there and I fully support that. Wonderful. Um, we will now go and take questions um, from our audience and from our online audience. I see several in the, in, in, uh, in the audience. So first we'll go here and, and then we'll go here. Oh, we can start. We can start there. We can start up there. <laughs> Hi, Robert Shredder, international investor. Uh, you seem to sidestep the moderator's good question about whether there could be any technical answers provided. And it seems also that the big sensitivity here and the, the thing driving this state legislation is the lack of parental control. Because the big gorilla in the room and the big money maker for a lot of these ser online services is still pornography, which seems to be, uh, you know, uh, evolving in a lot of ugly ways. So I think a lot of this could be diffused if there was a better effort to offer parental control. I see some of the services are even advertising that they're moving in that direction. And I wonder if you could comment a little bit more then about you know, let's try to remove pornography from this discussion and focus back on, you know, free speech. I did sign a bunch of NDAs when I started working at Facebook and left, but I'm pretty sure I wouldn't violate any of them if I said Facebook doesn't make money off of pornography. Um, neither does YouTube, maybe Twitter. I don't know about that one, but uh, that's like the wild, wild west of, of, of social media platforms. Um, Parental controls do exist. Um, these laws were not, Texas HB 20 and Florida SB 7072 were not driven by parental control concerns. Now there are other state legislature um, focuses and bills that are driven by that and that choice is currently challenging that in court pretty successfully. Uh, but SB 7072 and Texas HB 20 have a very long legislative history and both members of the legislature and uh, governors saying that they are passing this for the conservative bias reasons and not parental control reasons. Now, uh, I believe actually Paul Clement did say during uh, one of the parts of the arguments that um, it would make it much harder for platforms to get rid of bad stuff, harmful content, the lawful but awful content that kids would see if these laws went into effect. Because if these laws went into effect, you would have to moderate less. Um, and uh, that would be terrible because kids still do have access to um, social media and, I mean, it should be on parents. There can be a completely different all day forum mm -hmm. Cato can have on parental controls. But these laws were not motivated by protecting kids. Uh, we have a very clear record on that. I understand your concern for that. Um, also, should be said, the First Amendment does protect pornography. The only thing I add to that is maybe we'll be back here in, in a few years discussing um, the child safety online, Job age security. verification, and free speech debate, um, probably also um, as a result of, of net choice litigation. Um, so, yeah, what a yeah, and I, yeah. I would note that the, um, the you're, if we are not allowed to moderate viewpoint under, for instance, uh, uh, Texas laws, certain f many things that people may find harmful. Pro bulimia content. Exactly, like a lot of the content that people are concerned about. Uh, you, you have to allow both sides, and that becomes the challenge. And I think you saw the, the, the Texas Solicitor General struggling a little bit, especially with this question regarding t specifically on terrorism, but you could apply it to, yeah, anemia, bulimia, like all sorts of other child safety type issues as well. Uh, we'll go here. Thanks, David. Steve DelBianco with NetChoice. And a big aspect of content moderation was question two before the court, the notion of whether those laws could force small companies or large companies to explain every moderation decision down to the elements of their community standards that were violated and the notion of having to stand up an appeals process. And from the scale of a large company, and Ash knows this well, that scale is practically impossible. But Nathan, with a small business, 
the, the need to be able to explain every decision to anyone who asked and to be able to hold appeals. I, I was shocked that it didn't come up more during oral arguments because it is a question before the court. And if we are worried that the court will narrowly enjoin certain activities, would it allow that section of those laws to go into effect? And how will that affect content moderation? Thank you. Well, maybe I'll start while, while the, the gears turn. Um, to the latter point of your question, um, how will it impact content moderation? Well, think about the incentives that it sets. If you have to explain every decision, but, but maybe not the decisions that you don't make, well, maybe you'll make fewer decisions. Um, and I think that's part of the point of, of the law, and, and maybe you agree with that. And then to your earlier point on like the resources and the practicality of all of this, I think we, I hinted at this in my first answer highlighting the, the European Digital Services Act that has all these sorts of things. And oh, by the way, the services have to pay for it, um, the appeals process and, and the arbitration that you might go to if we extend out of that. And we have, have our, our, our own, um, you know, maybe that's a separate panel we'll, we'll do later. Um, but it's also worthwhile highlighting just the, the sorts of, of resources that startups um, and maybe even mid-sized companies put towards moderation. And then like this, um, you heard it a little bit about, you know, that'll be, a, what is it, 100 times more words than for YouTube. Okay, so what's gonna be for a startup? Probably, I don't know if that's gonna be even like quantifiable, but um, thinking about what they do now in terms of, of moderation, I've got some notes here. Um, Smallest startups, maybe you know, a few thousand years, don't really encounter a lot of, of problematic content to begin with, so why would they have a moderation team? Do they really need lots of moderation technologies? Do they need to license stuff to, to help them do that? Usually not, right? They're, they might, that might be in their product roadmap. They might be getting there, um, but, it's, but it's not gonna be the entirety of someone's job but they still wanna be able to take down spam. If they're a job posting board, they don't want gobbledygook on there because that diminishes trust. You're not gonna say, hey, I'm you know, Joe Job Seeker and I'm looking for a job and, you wanna, and you're gonna post your resume next to ADSDF semicolon? No, that's, that's crazy. Um, and it's probably pretty easy to explain why you take that down, spam, right? Maybe you can add technical things to make that faster um, but in a world absent those requirements, you don't have to explain that, um, and you shouldn't. Um. Well, the gears did turn. Uh, and uh, I would say the other thing I was thinking about, uh, I mean, there are so many unintended consequences we wouldn't even know, because again, both the people who passed the law, who are trying to enforce the law, or are defending the law in court, um, don't know, but, um, one of the kind of knee-jerk reactions would be, so if you look at mid-sized to big social media platforms or platforms that have a social media comment aspect to them, they have community standards, they have you know, set up teams or at least a few people who navigate those and make sure that there's consistency of application. Consistency, 100% accuracy can never be achieved no matter how much our technology develops or how many people they hire. They can hire a small or a big nation to do all the content moderation and consistency will never be achieved. And uh, it would lead to those like gotcha lawsuits, right? Of, oh, well, you didn't moderate this guy, but you moderated me. Is it because I have a mustache? Uh, <laughs> you just don't like people with mustaches, which I personally don't. Um, <laughs> so that, that would be that like one of those things that um, I'm guessing no one thought through uh, when they put that in the language of the bills, of the law. Yeah, the, uh, just looking at the sheer amount of content that is posted and then tr thinking about even if just a tiny fraction, 1% error, you multiply any massive number by a 1% error, you're gonna have a lot of mistakes. And then having to explain and, and, and don't get me wrong, I think social media companies try to and often do a, a provide appeal processes. Meta has set up an oversight board to try to create an additional appeals process. So it's not like some aren't trying, but the sheer amount of content that will be potentially mistaken. And then, yeah, the potential for a lawsuit, well, you took mine wrongfully down because insert my reason here, and now we have to, the social media companies have to you know, affirmatively disprove that it was on the basis of a bias or it was because of a viewpoint discrimination. A lot of lawyers will get very rich. 
Maybe we just need to slightly switch what we're doing and we'll have some job security. Should have gone to law school. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had a question over here. Oh. He was just waving. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, a question right here. Hi, so um, a question that I've been thinking about and I, I want to see if you think is, is true or not to begin with. I've heard that on a lot of bigger social media platforms that a large percentage of users are actually from like a troll farm or something from another country and um, who, whose goal is basically just to, to spread misinformation or, or cause chaos in the US. And, and I want to see if you guys think that's true to begin with and if it is true, um, if, there's, if there's any way to address those specific users. I wouldn't say, uh, like, most, I think the way you worded the question, it was like, most of the, like, users on big social media platforms are from a troll farm. Uh, maybe Twitter, uh, sorry, X, is getting closer to, <laughs> like, that proportion. I mean, you would be a better person to answer this question, because what you worked on yeah. uh, had to do directly with this, so I'm going to stop talking. Yeah, so I would say that I, I was looking at the numbers recently, and um, I th I f Facebook does actually report the number of com comments removed for spam as opposed to all their other moderation decisions. I want to say it was 1.1 billion pieces of content removed for spam in like, uh, like one of their pre prior quarters. So there is a lot of spam sort of art you know, trying to drive artificial engagement, things like that. There is that kind of content. That being said, um, I, I know uh, there's a, I, I wouldn't say that my team, I, when I was on the content moderation team at, at Meta, that we, that was the, the, a big issue that we saw. It was a issue, but like I said, a lot of the algorithms, a lot of the models we had, were getting pretty good at removing a lot of spam. The question was about, I guess, a foreign influence on a foreign our- foreign influence, on, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, and foreign influence specifically, I would say, you do see some of that, but I think there's been a good bit of research to say that it hasn't been terribly effective. Like, yes, there are people who are trying to engage campaigns that are, you know, bots that are spreading things. People can, can do that. But A, going back to my original question, just in general, we're getting good at taking down, uh, Meta was getting good at taking down artificial, fake, spammy type content, things that were inauthentic in nature. But then in addition, it just wasn't having, I think there's been a research that shows it just not being very effective, even the stuff that wasn't found. So uh, I, yeah, that's, that would be my answer to that. All right, any, we'll take one more question before we get ready for the next panel. I don't any know, others? Question. should we do a wrap up of like yeah. what we think was gonna happen and yeah, how the world is gonna end? Sure, you can give me your, your, your final thoughts and then we'll, we'll close out the panel, please. I genuinely think if uh, the decision in uh, both the Texas and Florida Net Choice and CCIA cases uh, goes for the states, uh, it will be the first step in unraveling the last few decades of First Amendment doctrine altogether. Um, and it's going to be a very painful process. And uh, the world is not going to end, but it's slowly going to change. And the way we see speech is going to change. Um, and partially, and the difference between the United States and anywhere in Europe is because unlike European countries, we're much more litigious. Uh, so the, we're not just gonna turn into France where you know they don't get some of this and some of that, but overall they're fine. No, 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 it's, it's gonna be much more uh, intense. And then maybe we'll start scaling that back, but it will be a couple of decades long problem and battle that will probably land us in a place that's very different from what we have right now. But I'm hoping it won't happen. I don't know how to follow that up other than to say, let's hope that doesn't happen. Um, but if you do end up in the world, I do think that um, the same sorts of concerns that motivated these laws are going to come out much stronger, right? So if you actually, like, the, the outcome of these, if, if the outcome is for the states, um, that's shrinking First Amendment rights, um, shrinking free speech or, or free press. Um, and that's not a good thing. And as twisted around um, b backwards and confused that, that the folks that, that say they're for free speech that are um, for these laws um, are, maybe one day they'll come to realize that far too late after the walls have closed in. Um, and again, we end up in an unfamiliar world. Um, 
Yeah, I think it's a good place to end it. And can you join me in thanking our panelists? And thank you for coming.
Thank you, and welcome back to what is our last panel of what has been, I think, a very productive day of conversations around the net choice cases and the future of online speech. My name is Jennifer Huddleston, and I am a technology policy research fellow here at the Cato Institute. I'm very excited about this last panel, not only for those of you who are joining us in the room, but in some ways particularly for those of you that are tuning in online, because what we're really going to be discussing is what could these cases and what do things like the Florida and Texas laws, as well as some of the laws we've seen around the world, mean for the future of online speech for the everyday internet user, as well as for those of us who have seen new speech opportunities arise with these online uh, platforms. I'm very excited to be joined today by two leading experts. First, we have Kathy Gellis, who is a Bay Area practicing attorney, as well as a well-regarded internet expert, and was the author of an amicus brief in the Net Choice cases. Thank you for, for joining us from out in California and, and being here with us in DC. And then I'm also joined by Neil Chilson, who is a senior research fellow at the Center for Growth and Opportunity, and also the former chief technologist of the Federal Trade Commission. So thank you both for being here. Thanks for having Thanks. us. As a reminder, in case you have just tuned into our event, if you're joining us online, you may join the conversation and submit questions for our panelists at our later Q&A, either using the Q&A form on the web page, Facebook, YouTube, or on X, formerly known as Twitter, using the hashtag Cato1A. So I want to get started with something that kind of came up in the conversation and oral arguments that I think may have surprised some folks. A lot of us who have been watching these cases for a while have been talking about how these really are First Amendment cases. We hear the term Section 230 thrown around a lot, and, and in some cases it seems like Section 230 is to blame for whatever a particular policymaker may not like that's going on online. But we did hear Section 230 brought up in the oral arguments. So first off, what is Section 230, and how does it relate to the debate about free speech online? Section 230 is statutory protection for platforms, and it protects them to do two things. In general, Congress, back in the mid-90s, had two objectives. They wanted the most good stuff online and the least amount of bad stuff online. And instead of going with um, a, uh, a stick-based approach of like whacking the platforms to make them do it exactly the way they wanted to do it, they came up with Section 230 more as a carrot approach to incentivize the platforms to do their moderation as, to align the incentives so that they would be inclined to do it as best they could. And so that they would be in a position where they could leave the most good stuff up because they wouldn't have to worry about getting in trouble if they took, uh, if they left too much of it up and some of it turned out to be not good stuff after all. And it also protected them if they took too much down because they also wouldn't have to get in trouble if they did take too much down. So they could take the most bad stuff, which was really a major impetus driving Congress because this is attached to the Communications Decency Act where Congress was really worried about too much bad stuff on the internet. But they decided that basically we will make it safe for platforms to leave up the most of the good and take down the most of the bad and they don't have to worry being second guessed about it. That is important and it creates statutory protection for the platforms. And these cases do implicate Section 230 because there's a preemption clause in Section 230 that says if you, no state gets to make a law that messes with the paradigm that Congress has passed. And both Florida and Texas have laws that are messing with the paradigm that Congress has passed. Texas and Florida do not like how the platforms have taken down uh, what they think is too much content, and they want there to be liability attached to those decisions, which runs smack into Section 230. So you could deal with these two laws on that basis. But underneath there, there's still a sort of core constitutional principle of can the, do the platforms have their own First Amendment right to choose what content they want to have on their systems and choose what content they don't want to. And the answer constitutionally has to be yes. And the way the, the 
the laws have been challenged and the litigation has developed, that has brought that question to the fore. And we can get back to Section 230. If there's a remand, you could always decide that the, the laws are, um, they violate Section 230 and thus are no good that way. But you do have that bigger con core constitutional question, and it's important to answer that one yes, because otherwise the only thing holding the internet together is Section 230, and it's under fire in a number of respects anyway, and that's not nearly as strong as the Constitution protecting the online ecosystem for expression online. Neil, in oral arguments and in our lot of conversations, we've heard about Section 230 and the First Amendment as it relates to these online platforms. How do these things come into play when it comes to the user's speech themselves? How does What could this case mean in terms of what the everyday user may need to understand about the First Amendment and about Section 230? Well, I, you know, I, I liked how Corbin captured it, and Kathy did a great job. Um, I, I think of the First Amendment as providing a, a fundamental right, and then Section 230 is tort reform that enables not just the platforms, but also users to ex exercise that right um, without the threat of spurious litigation. And so it's, it's essentially a tort reform law. You can think of it that way. And when you think of it that way, I think it clarifies a, a few things about how the platforms uh, and users might be affected if these laws are changed. And so um, if, if the Supreme Court upholds the Florida and Texas laws, uh, I think we, we've heard some of the alternative approaches from on the previous panel. I think Daphne Keller has a, a good catalog of, of options that might happen here. You know, you get the, the fire hose of garbage uh, approach that might happen. You get the only puppies approach that might happen. Or you get like really expensive compliance that uh, doesn't really clear up the problems, but what it does is it adds a, lit a lot of litigation costs. And I, so I think the practical effect for users is that um, content moderation will continue. It's very likely to continue, but it won't be any clearer about how this happens because these standards are not very clear. And the, the companies will be in the position of trying to figure out how uh, to best comply with very vague uh, overreaching laws um, without diminishing the functionality of their platforms. And I think that's just a very hard um, uh, nut to crack. I, I don't think that there's any really good balancing there. And on, uh, on, uh, on effect, I think we'd get uh, what Cory Doctorow has called the enshittification of the internet, um, but from this side of things. Kathy, I'm gonna come to you with a, a similar but slightly different question, because I think oftentimes these laws get brought up in the idea of they're just about politics. You know, if you're, if you're not really engaged in political ideology fights, you don't need to be too worried. This was, you know, kind of a brought forward on a, a basis of the Florida law specifically about political officials. The the Texas law refers to viewpoint. Now, all three of us work on tech policy issues. When we're on various social media platforms, we're often posting about policy and, and there could be some debate about whether or not that promotes a, a specific viewpoint. But if I take a step back and think about some of the other things that I may use the internet for, whether it's posting about running or Taylor Swift or the latest Sarah J. Matt's book, what could that mean for the average internet user when it comes to their experience online and their ability to have various conversations? There's no limiting principle to these laws unless the First Amendment bars them all full, full stop. Um, these laws in theory are targeted for some of the larger tech platforms that we know and love. It's gonna go for Facebook, Google, potentially Twitter, although size is a relevant factor and Twitter may or may not still be big enough to be underneath them. But let's say there's a whole bunch that, yeah, we know they were going for these platforms, which are platforms that are sort of known as take all comers, all sorts of speech, they're not specialized. But they're challenging that First Amendment right of the platform to exercise its own editorial discretion, which means there's really nothing to prevent these states or any other states to pass their own laws that, go, that direct themselves at smaller platforms, specialized platforms, platforms that, you know, 
we have the, the puppies are us forum uh, dot org and um, you know they're gonna have a hard time keeping the cats off because they won't have the First Amendment right to say no to the cats just to keep up the dogs this case challenges their right of the you know the dog fancier site to keep off the cats and you know and take that for any other specialized site of any other size individually run websites so on the amicus brief that I filed we had um, an individual mastodon admin um, he runs his site so that he can host conversation among his tech policy colleagues, um, his friends, the people that he likes to stimulate conversation he thinks that's important. And his right to do that would be under fire if these laws are blessed because they gun for the ability of a platform to make the decisions of what speech do I want to allow and what speech do I not want to disallow, and that will apply to every platform on the internet that all of us use kind of without realizing it because, oh, we're not on Facebook, but we're still engaging with an internet intermediary, and it matters to our online experience, and they won't be able to provide that service anymore. Can I just add yeah. to that a little bit, which is that um, in the CGO brief, uh, Mika's brief, uh, we talked about how the First Amendment has a universalizing approach to the, the US, like that the, the First Amendment is the First Amendment across all of the states. Um, if the Supreme Court decides that the First Amendment does not do that, the First Amendment in coordination with the 14th Amendment does not do that, but that states can sort of craft their own speech environments, um, what we end up with is, a, as, as um, Ash mentioned on the previous panel, uh, balkanization. And so we have a balkanization of First Amendment rights and a balkanization of speech environments. And that means that somebody in California might have different speech rights in practice than somebody in Texas or Florida. And that um, is just uh, inconsistent with the First Amendment approach of providing uh, protection for fundamental rights. And so, uh, and, in, and on top of that, I think it's also just complex both for platforms, but especially for users. If you don't know why your content was taken down in one place or, or like something that you say doesn't reach people in certain states because they have a different standard, uh, it really does undermine the ability of these, uh, the internet to become a conduit for uh, you know, niche or discriminated against views uh, of all kinds. And, and that's, uh, that's been one of the big benefits of the internet, and I think that that would be one of the benefits that would be taken away under this type of balkanization of First Amendment rights. It takes away the ability to get anything better. One of my other clients on my amicus brief was Blue Sky. If you're unhappy with the way Twitter looks these days, well, good news, you have a choice. But you only have a choice in a legal ecosystem which gives those new platforms the ability to build themselves up in a way that they believe will most satisfy their user base. If they don't have that freedom to have that discretion, they're not going to be able to exist as well, assuming they can even exist at all. So, um, you know, even if you, we can talk about this will impinge on specialized platforms, but also impinge on any new general platform where if you don't like the editorial policy exercised by Twitter or Threads, you can go elsewhere, you can go to Blue Sky, you can go to Truth Social. Those sites all depend on the same uh, doctrine that, that's under fire by Texas and Florida right now. I wanna dig a little bit deeper into this because it's often portrayed again that these laws are only about the largest platforms, only about the, the kind of household names, the Facebooks, the Instagrams, the TikToks, et cetera. But the actual number of monthly active users in the Texas law is 50 million. And yesterday during, or Monday during oral arguments, I, I was doing a quick search and that includes platforms like Pinterest, that includes things like Discord, which we heard brought up in the Texas oral arguments, although I think it might've been referred to as Discourse. So I'm assuming I haven't missed the new social media app, but this ecosystem moves so quickly, maybe there is a new- That's a feature, <laughs> not a bug. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, things like Twitch that, that have a more, specific community. And then in the Florida law, there was even discussion about kind of the broader context of user-generated content, how this would impact Etsy, how this would impact Uber. We've dived a lot into that in, on other platforms, but building off of what you both said, Neil, you brought up that a California user might have different speech rights than a Texas user under these laws. And Kathy, you brought up the number of new platforms what could this mean for the average user when it comes to that ecosystem of choice? Would they have more choices or, or fewer choices? Fewer choices. 
because the other choices, um, the other choices aren't going to be able, they may not be able to exist at all. If, what is the dogfancier.org site supposed to do? Is it allowed to keep off the kitten pictures? This, this law puts that question into judgment. The only thing that would save it potentially is it's a small site so it might fall under the, the radar. Um, but that's not reliable because if you can say, Florida, you can do this, and Texas, you can do that, then Missouri can do something else, and California can do something else. And there's a lot of states that are trying to do something else, all based on the same principle of, we do not like how platforms are exercising their editorial freedom, and so we're going to go take away that freedom and control it. All the states want to do this in some respect. Their values aren't necessarily the same. I don't think the values of Governor Newsom and the values of Governor Abbott are the same. Um, and then what do you do? You've got this big collision of two states. One saying, leave this up, and another state is saying, take it down. What is the platform supposed to do just on a practical standpoint? How can you possibly comply? So the, the answer to your question is, if you make life impossible for the platforms who facilitate user speech, that's bad news for the user speech. It's going to have a hard time getting online. Yeah, on one aspect, you could see, uh, let's say this was a federal type law. Um, you, you would have a, which is a terrible idea, by the way, don't do that. Uh, but if you had something like that, you would get complete homogenization across social media platforms, right? So it wouldn't really make that much of a difference if you were on a different platform because the content's basically going to be the same. They're only allowed to do, you would get sort of like around the margins, like which one is willing to take more legal risk than another. But generally, your, your selection of platforms wouldn't really matter that much. So you get this sort of like, nationalization effect, a single provider of, of social media. But that's not the case that we have here. What we have here is you get a single like standard for each state. And so do you have choice? Well, I guess if you want to pack up your house and move to a different state, yeah, you might have a different set of social media platforms that work differently. Um, but that's the level of choice that you would have to exercise is physically moving from one state to another. And um, I know we're going to get into this later, but the analogy is so apt that uh, I'm going to jump right into it. Europe is having this problem, right? Like this is Europe's, in, Europe's entire history of the, uh, the European Union is we have a bunch of different places that have their own sets of rules and we're trying to like get them all to cooperate and get together. And this digital single market uh, effort that they've been going through to try to homogenize basic, just basic business principles and other things uh, has led to a lot of laws that are running right into this effort. And so they're trying to like sort of work their way backwards. Uh, or it's, it's like the U.S. is taking what is, a, by all accounts, a quite successful tech innovation environment and retrofitting to be more like Europe in so many ways. And we heard some sympathy for that from the bench yesterday, which was sort of shocking to me, frankly, that, that we might be point to what, the Europe is, what Europe is doing on digital services as a, a template for how we might want to do things in the US. And I just think that's, that's backwards looking and it's fundamentally inconsistent with the First Amendment as a first principle. It's not a good plan. So <laughs> I, I do want to move us on to the broader context of where f the overall debate about free speech online is. But before I do that, Kathy, as I mentioned, you helped author er, an amicus brief. Neil CGO had an, an amicus brief as well. I just wanted to give you each an opportunity to highlight any of the arguments that you made in those briefs, um, particularly as it relates to the impact that this case could have on users. Um, so I alluded to some of that. Um, I had three clients on my brief. I had Blue Sky, a brand new social media platform that's also innovating the, a protocol so that you're not dependent on that particular company to provide a platform with the protocol, other people could implement the software and end up running, essentially it's just microblogging and microblogging platforms that are able to interact with each other so that you don't have to live in one little silo. You can cultivate your own little silo um, for a particular community, but because it's got a standard protocol, it can reach users who are using other services to help them get online and facilitate their microblogging experience. Um, 
Then I also included um, an individual, Chris Riley, who runs his own Mastodon instance, and that's another instance that's another example of a microblogging platform which uses a standard protocol so that you can have multiple instances. He can provide access to his friends um, and he doesn't have to provide access to people he doesn't like, but that's okay because there will be other Mastodon instances out there that um, people can subscribe to. And then they'll still be able to talk to users on each platform and share ideas across them in a standard way that has standard treatment. So your experience can still functionally be very Twitter-like, but you don't have to be dependent on one company or one service provider to provide the whole experience. And then the third client I had was the Copia Institute, which you may know more as uh, part of the same company that provides TechDirt, the online uh, legal news policy site, uh, it's a blog, and it's a blog that takes comments. And if you're um, facilitating user expression in your comments, then all these laws matter to you. You need Section 230 uh, so that you can allow that moderation to happen, and you also need the First Amendment so that you're in the position of uh, having comment, choosing to have comments or choosing not to have comments and um, having some sort of editorial value around that. And then TechDirt also has the um, the related interest of, it's a speaker, it's a media outlet, it writes lots of blog posts. I write lots of blog posts on it too, and that's very nice to write them. Um, sometimes we wanna use other platforms to help spread them so we can make sure that everybody reads our brilliant ideas, and we're dependent on other platforms to help that discourse spread. Um, TechDirt also uses other platforms to, inter uh, to facilitate conversations with its users and its user community, from which point it gets tips and other ideas, and it's an ecosystem of how do you engage with your audience. So it also, all these laws also affect something like TechDirt indirectly, because if it, even if it left TechDirt alone, you can have your comment section have fun. Um, if it affects our ability to like tweet our links, then, um, then we still have a problem where indirectly taking away and I even just impacting the larger platforms ultimately has an impact on other people's expression uh, indirectly. And so these were some of the major points that we wanted to make that this is, you gotta look past Facebook. You have to look past the big, the big tech. This isn't about big tech. This is about an ecosystem of how the internet works where all expression is dependent on intermediaries to help facilitate that expression. And if you pinch the intermediaries, you're not gonna get any expression. And the irony is that Texas and Florida have said, these laws are about we're standing up for expression because we don't like that expression got removed. The logical consequence of the regulatory environment they're pushing for is a lot more expression is gonna take a hit. Neil, anything you wanted to highlight from the CGO's brief before we move on? Sure, so CGO filed a brief with 11 uh, state think tanks and policy organizations, and we covered the balkanization point that I, I mentioned earlier, uh, and I won't dig into that uh, so much, but we also covered just the practical realities of the online speech environment right now uh, as one that's highly competitive, very robust, and actually um, quite uh, open to lots of different viewpoints, including conservative views. Uh, we pointed out some of the statistics around the popularity of conservative views on platforms like Facebook, uh, and the fact that in the top 10 posts is very frequently Charlie Kirk and a, another set of groups um, who are espousing conservative styled uh, speech. And so these platforms have been big boons in many ways for people whose, uh, whose speech maybe offends or is not favored by gatekeepers. Um, and I'm always amused by the, the, the fact that uh, when conservatives complain about social media sites and the restrictions that they have on their speech, um, compared to what is the, the question that economists always ask. Um, if you went back to an era where the New York Times was the record, uh, uh, you know, the, the paper of record, and there were three broadcast channels, um, do you think it was easier to get through conservative uh, speech past those gatekeepers than it is now to share your ideas online? I, I, don't think it, I don't think that's true. I think the internet has been a big boon for speech online. And we made that point in the brief. Um, one of the things that we pointed out was that, uh, you know, how much times had changed even since these laws were passed. Um, there has already been several mentions of the change of ownership in X to Elon Musk. The Fifth Circuit called Twitter a monopoly. 
Um, and not only has it changed ownership completely, but there's been a whole ecosystem of Twitter-like companies that have come up, including from some of the other biggest uh, companies that are out there. So you have Threads, which is specifically aimed at being a competitor to Twitter and taking advantage of the fact that maybe users were not as satisfied with the content moderation policies on that platform. So I just think the, the facts on the ground suggest that the, the motivations for these laws were not, uh, are not well grounded. Um, and that's just you know, the frosting on top of the fact that th this cake is baked without the First Amendment in mind. So I want to move to kind of the second part of our title about the future of online speech. And in some ways, this relates to the net choice cases. But we do seem to be in this kind of unique moment where there is a lot of friction around online speech, not only from traditionally totalitarian regimes that we've long seen put restrictions on free speech, whether it's online or offline, but also from places in the world that have traditionally been seen as kind of bastions of, of free speech to, to some degree. I have to think on, on one of our prior panels, somebody was joking of, well, if something happens, I, I might have to, to move to Canada. And yet it seems like at least every, rather regularly now, we're, we're seeing a potentially free speech um, coordinating bill out of the Canadian parliament. I think another one which just introduced yesterday, if we look over in Europe, we've heard the Digital Services Act already mentioned, which there's been a lot of concerns about what that could mean for the future of content moderation and online speech. But we can also look at things that are going on around blasphemy laws reappearing in, in parts of Europe or around hate speech laws. We've certainly seen debates around the German hate speech law and its Im impact. What is going on with free speech around the world, I guess is my, my just starter question to, to both of you. I, there is power in expression. It's why we have a First Amendment to protect it, because it's why the powerful don't like it. If you want to maintain your power, you make sure that nobody can talk about it. But I think there's a flip side. So one of the things is very powerful people are unhappy with having their power challenged, and to the extent that they're coming from more auto autocratic regimes, they're going to use their power to make sure that they disable free expression in order to disable the, 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 to neutralize the power that might challenge them. But I think you have a slightly different question, but still basically the same power dynamics in what you were talking about, the more liberal places where, well, we're not autocracies, we're democracies, and surely we believe in free speech. And I think one of the things we're we're bumping into is expression is powerful and it's empowered an awful lot of people and not everybody uses that freedom to express themselves necessarily in the most constructive ways. And there's some pain points that come out of how people use their rights of free expression and particularly how they've been able to use them online. And there are reactions to, wait a second, maybe this isn't good, something should be done. And so reasonable people will say something should be done. And reasonable governments may say, you're right, something should be done. But we are reacting out of, um, reacting to specific instances that ca are causing some pain and potentially doing damage where we're confronting a moment in history where everybody can now talk to each other. And we don't entirely know how to do that well. And we're learning. And there's some growing pains as we figure this out. It's really incumbent even on the, the liberal democracies to take a more hands-off approach to not try to over-control things because if you over-control things, you all of a sudden turn into the autocracy because you will embed power in people who are able to seize it and use it and there won't be a way to challenge it because you've squelched the right that other people have to express themselves in ways that would challenge that power. And you know, it may be motivated by legitimate concerns, legitimate fears, but it's a dangerous path to go down because there's no way to do it where you just get rid of the bad stuff and keep the good stuff. The reason why we articulate our uh, doctrine of free expression the way we do is that you've got to get the government out of the way because nobody can effectively decide in a way that we will all do agree what is the good stuff and what is the bad stuff. And once you start trying to decide, you've basically blown the opportunity for the freedom to exist in a way that um, it just gives somebody the power to decide and they'll decide in a ways that suit them and don't necessarily suit the greater good. I'd say, Kathy, your, your point that um, ideas are powerful 
Uh, they're maybe the most powerful thing. And so the history of technology that empowers people to spread ideas is one of big disruption and one of causing a lot of societal change. And so when you look back to the printing press, not nearly as effective uh, for the individual as uh, to spread information as social media platforms. Uh, you had institutions that were not, certainly there was not a First Amendment, generally speaking. Um, there, maybe there were some free, free speech principles, but that was a, such a disruptive technology to the status quo institutions that Europe had like 100 years of war over it, right, essentially. And so I don't think that it should be surprising to us that there is a lot of people looking out there and saying, <clears throat> Look, I like free speech, it's great. I just don't like it when those guys say those things. And so that seems like a problem to me. I mean, that is the history of, of humankind in communication. Um, we need to stick to the principle because, uh, because that principle is pretty time tested at this point. We've seen that we as a society can adapt to new forms of communication. I always think back to um, something that Adam Thierer told me and it was a, it was a real eye opener to me about the difference between the, the fights on technology where, um, that don't involve speech and the fights that do involve speech. Um, when we fight about technologies that don't involve speech, there is a tech panic cycle, right? There's always early adopters who really like it and are on the bleeding edge and they're, they're not quite sure what to do with it, but they're kind of exploring it and figuring it out. Then you get sort of a backlash, you get this peak panic Sometimes government acts, sometimes they don't, but you know, eventually, basically, it gets absorbed into society, we all use it. Uh, automobile, I mean, just think any technology, that's basically what we're talking about. Speech platforms, because of the threat that they hold to those who are in charge, that cycle never, you never get past that cycle. And so the history of new media is always one of government trying to control it. And, and those in power trying to control it. It's not just government, it could just be uh, you know, elite institutions that are the incumbents trying to control it. That's what we're going through right now is the fight of elite institutions to maintain their, their, their hold that they've had on the ability of people to communicate ideas. Um, that hold and those structures, they have benefits, but they have huge drawbacks as well. And, and the history of the First Amendment in the, in the US suggests that we need to help them let go uh, and help build new institutions that help us learn how to talk to each other uh, better online and off. Actually, can I punk respond to myself real, real quick? Um, <laughs> I framed it in the negative about why, okay, things are tough or challenged, legitimate people for legitimate reasons are, are afraid and wanna do something. And I said, oh, don't do that because you're just gonna empower, empower more of what you don't like. And that is all true. But people don't like responding to the, what do you mean I can't, I have to just put up with this because it'll be worse if I don't. Um, there is something else to be said. There is a positive way of thinking about it that the way through the things that challenge us today is to maintain the freedoms that will allow us to solve our problems because we're not throwing arbitrary obstacles in our way to prevent us from innovating the solutions that we need. The actual answer to this is I know it hurts now, but keep going because that's how you get through this. Muddle so, through. Mud well, more than muddle through, that freedom, we can sit here and have all the um, you know, colloquiums we want and we will get to better choices, better days, because we're going to be able to come up with better ideas and we'll come up with better platforms and we'll come up with better services. This is what's going to make the world better because we don't have things standing in our way saying no to the things that would be better. So maintaining that freedom is absolutely important to make sure that you can have something better and whenever you clip the wings of that, you clip your ability to actually solve your problems. Before I move on to one of those newer expression-based technologies, or, or at least debatably expression-based technologies, I do want to ask one more question about this kind of overall environment of free expression, which is basically, why should your average American user care? We, we have the First Amendment here. Why should they perhaps be paying attention to what's going on in Europe with the DSA or what's going on in Canada with their various uh, potential regulations. Is it just a matter of because we heard kind of vague references to it at the Supreme Court in this case, or is there something bigger for free expression that may mean the average user needs to pay attention? They'll miss it when it's gone. Um, and the, there is some question about how soon, how dramatically, um, will it be more like turning up the, the heat on a pot or will it be more like being thrown into something more traumatic originally? 
Um, but if you remember what the world is like today, and we don't preserve the First Amendment as is being challenged right now, today is going to be a day that the future will never be able to imagine. It's going to be so far into their lived experience. Um, and good luck with maintaining democracy in that context. Uh, so I, I think there's uh, there's a bunch of different answers about why I pay attention to the overall, overall arc. Um, one is just a basic um, empathy for other humans. I mean, w the First Amendment rights that we have in the US, uh, other people deserve those rights too. In fact, they have those rights. Their governments just don't protect them. And so I think that uh, sort of seeding the world to uh, a view that government should be managing how people express themselves uh, is something that we should all feel is not just un-American, but it's, it's bad for humans. And so, um, so I would say we should pay attention to those things. The other more practical reason is because a lot of these regimes are building technologies, China, for example, or uh, they're building uh, legal technologies that are going to, that are, that are serving as templates around the world, and some of that is coming back into the US as well. And so we saw a small example of that on, on the bench, but we've seen lots of examples of that in Congress uh, and in the state legislatures where they are looking to what Europe is doing around this and sort of putting on blinders as to the actual very dem demonstrable effects that it's had on the European ability to build new technologies and saying, we want to do that too. Um, and so those templates are not going to go away. I think it's worth engaging in that fight, um, not just here, but around the world, uh, because, because people around the world deserve to have t tools that empower them and deserve uh, the, the, and have the right to, to speak their minds. You know, it wouldn't be a tech policy event in 2024 if we didn't discuss artificial intelligence and AI. So if, I apologize, but we're going to have to ask some questions about artificial intelligence and AI, and particularly how it relates to both the future of free expression online as well as to some of the debates that we're, we're currently having. So, Neil, I'm going to start with you, and I think you kind of brought up a, an interesting framework in your answer to a prior question. Is artificial intelligence one of those technologies where we're going to have kind of the free expression side of the, the techno panic and debate? Or do you think it's a, a different type of technology? And how are we already seeing that play out? Oh, it's a great question. Um, uh, way to take my framework and spit it back at me. Now I've got to apply it in real time. Um, so I, I think AI does affect this. Uh, there were some mentions of it uh, during oral argument. But uh, the CGO brief also mentioned it as artificial intelligence and algorithms are inherent into, in the processes that these companies are using um, when they're dealing with massive amounts of content online. And so uh, some of the briefs had argued essentially that this means that it can't be the platform speech. Um, I thought there were some really great points made on the earlier panel that there doesn't have to be a clear message. It's not like it's the AI's message. That doesn't matter. The, ma the, the point is somebody designed that to try to create an environment. That is the, the freedom of the, the press, uh, maybe even the uh, freedom of association to have people on that platform and engage or not. So there's, there's that sort of application. But now to dial back to my framework, uh, I think actually AI, the generative AI technology that we're talking about, not just algorithms, uh, more broadly, but the sort of large language models, chat GPT, the, the um, image creation things like mid-journey is actually uh, quite different than social media in uh, a bunch of ways. First, on the sort of free expression and the choice range, um, it is much, the market signals are much clearer with generative AI than they are in social media. Um, when I put a post on TikTok or on Twitter and it doesn't go viral, like it's really hard for me to figure out why. When I ask Gemini to generate, you know, founding fathers and it gives me back something that looks historically incredibly inaccurate, although admirably diverse, um, uh, it's pretty easy to tell, right? And so those signals, I, I think we're seeing right now that there are immense market pressures on these types of tools to um, calibrate to what their consumers want. And that it's not that that doesn't exist in the social media space, but the signals are much less direct. Um, the second thing that's, that's quite different uh, is that 
Well, first of all, there's a lot of these models are essentially pay models. They're not ad driven. And so that just has a whole bunch of different uh, potentials for how, how they deal with customers. Um, and and the, I think the third one is that choice is much easier in this space in some ways, right? Like one of the big values of social networks, not always, but often, is that they have a big reach. And so there's these network effects where it's, it's kind of hard to leave a platform, even if you're not super happy with it, um, because you're invested in the network that you have there. That is definitely not true in the AI content generation space. People try something here, they try something there, they compare it, they see which one they like better, they might use it for this type of thing on this day and use it for uh, a different thing on. There's the, the ability to switch is much easier. And so I think, the, the, I think the free speech dynamics in AI are quite, generative AI are quite different than social media. And so I have cautioned ever since the first hearing on generative AI where essentially Congress brought their social media talking points to the, the generative AI discussion, we shouldn't think of these things as the same. They're quite different. One of those social media talking points that's been brought to the generative AI discussion is, of course, back to our old friend, Section 230. So, Kathy, I'm going to turn to you with the question that seems to be on everyone's mind. What is your take on does Section 230 apply to generative AI? It can. I mean, I... So you told me we were going to talk about AI, and I told you I'd probably roll my eyes. <laughs> and the reason I roll my eyes is because this new buzzword is just swallowing up all the oxygen. And you know, it's not like we really sorted out our doctrinal understanding of anything else before we threw this new technology. So like, we're still figuring out, does the First Amendment apply to the internet? How does Section 230 work? And now we've added this degree of difficulty where you have this technology that's part buzzword, part pie in the sky, part some really stupid ideas, and an awful lot of fear and moral panics that are probably not well-founded. And it's all coming together in this morass. I think the answer to your question is, go back and understand Section 230, because essentially everything comes down to first principles. How does the First Amendment work? How does Section 230 work? All of these principles can then be scaled up and applied to technology. Like, I don't buy what I think Justice Alito said in the hearing of like, well, the First Amendment long ago predated uh, the internet. It also predated most of the periodic table and our discovery of most of the elements we take for granted now. I'm not just talking the ones at the radiation, like the one uh, the above 100s. I mean, some really core ones that like, you know, they hadn't found them yet, but they're like integral to our lives. You can have constitutional freedoms that scale up for technology. You can have statutes that predate certain evolution of technology like Section 230 continue to apply. I think for Section 230 itself, it comes down to the core question. Of the specific expression at issue that somebody is objecting to, who imbued it with the quality that is now objectionable? I don't want to see, even say wrongful because sometimes it's just people throw lawsuits because they don't like it and then they're going to lose the lawsuit, but Section 230 defends whether the lawsuit is meritorious or not. And I think that's the question. That's always the question in Section 230. Who imbued the content with its wrongful quality? If it was a user who created a message, and if they created the message using the tool, then it is probably them, in which case Section 230 will apply to insulate the intermediary from any other liability. But if it was the intermediary employing this particular technology as part of their platform services that used the technology to create expression that had a wrongful quality, then 230 doesn't apply because it's their speech directly. The exact same questions that apply without AI apply with AI, and what worries me is it's we've gotten really bad at applying them to the non-AI uh, situations. It would be nice if we got them right and settled before we moved on and made it harder, but the same principles apply. Yeah. I, oh, go ahead. Uh, so I think, you know, if you go back to my framing of Section 230 as tort reform, uh, uh, we need tort reform in lots of spaces. So uh, whether or not Section 230 applies to generative AI models, um, I do think that the legal principle that we should deter behave bad behavior by the people who commit that bad behavior rather than the tools they use applies uh, across the board. And so uh, we, we may need to figure out some ways to do that uh, in the generative AI space. But I do think that it is an important principle of uh, you know, US law that we need to make sure applies to, to your point, 
properly in the generative AI space. Actually, I just want to uh, punctuate that with one comment, because you've used the tort reform. That may work in this crowd. It's not going to work with some of the bluer crowds. Um, I think the other way of framing uh, Section 230 is um, more as a rule of civil procedure, because what it ends up doing is cutting down on um, abusive lawsuits that are challenging expression, um, and in particular, challenging the rights of first expression that the platforms have so that they can be in the position of saying yes to content and saying no to content. If you think about it in those terms, A, I think you'll have more political traction across the spectrum, but I think that's also the power of why Section 230 is important, and when you extrapolate it out to these new technologies, the same things apply. Um, we are worried about a chilling effect of litigation slowing down things that should be constitutionally protected, innovation and expression. Section 230 says thou shalt not sue, um, um, you know, in certain circumstances. And uh, I think framing it like that, of that's what its job is to do, then when you look at that job, then you apply it to AI and see where does it need to kick in to make sure we're not chilling, you know, good and useful innovations of AI technology. I do want to take some time and turn to audience questions. I'm going to start with a question from online while our, our mic runners can, can start going to some of the hands in the room, which I thought was a very interesting question, which is one of the ways we've seen users using the internet is for various modes of digital activism. What could be the implication of these cases for digital activism online? Well, I, I know your brief touched on that uh, on behalf of uh, Copia Institute. Um, uh, and we also touched on that in the CGO brief on behalf of the state think tanks who uh, are big users of social media platforms to get their messages out. Uh, and if these laws go into effect, the platforms will be faced with, well, if I post something from this group, I'm going to have to make sure that uh, it's balanced by you know, something from the opposite side, even if nobody else wants to hear, you know, it could be my, I, that's a little biased, nobody wants to hear my opponent's arguments, really, they just want to hear mine. Uh, and so that, that creates um, a lot of friction, it creates a chilling effect on the platforms, and I think for the advocacy groups that I work for, who, for whom social media has been a big uh, megaphone for their ideas, uh, it makes it harder for them to continue to spread their ideas uh, on state policy reform. Yeah, I, I, I think if you're thinking, well, this can't happen to me, you might get lucky, but you'd just be getting lucky. This is, um, this is not good for any, look, there are certain social movements that know they are not popular in Texas and Florida. Um, you know, Texas, even the most content neutral way of approaching it is, uh, that is a rule that says platforms can't host an entire category of topic, pro or con, uh, which means that, you know, would you like to discuss reproductive freedoms? I mean, I, you, you can't um, because the platforms can't host it at all or else if they have to host yours, they're gonna host exactly the view that you don't want. And really, these laws challenge the ability of platforms to say yes to anything that's provocative if the government that they're that is going to reach them wants to say no to that. And you know you have social activism because you are challenging some prevailing views, but the prevailing views have a lot of power and if they have the power over the platforms to say and can force them to say no to what you want to say, then how are you going to be able to speak against it? Or for it for that matter. I'll go to our audience for a question. I really appreciated the focus on 230 at the beginning and the end, a distinction from the First Amendment and the notion of tort reform. And yet, when we compare ourselves to the rest of the world, and we look over time as to why did we need the tort reform, I'm hoping you can say a little more about the Wolf of Wall Street and why we got 230, and why the US culture of lawsuits is uniquely hazardous to platforms, because the rest of the world doesn't have a Section 230. To their detriment. Um, I think one issue that came up, and I know that Paul Clement, um, uh, I think, raised it before the court, is you had a situation where it wasn't just that um, the platform's ability to say no to, a, to certain content or say yes to certain content was under fire. They were in a position where if they looked at the content and had knowledge of what was there and then made a decision, they would be in super duper extra trouble. And that, and that looking at it and having some sense of what was going on ended up being the, the link that caused them to potentially be liable. And that was not sustainable because, uh, 
because basically it would mean at that point that even if you had the right to leave the content up or take the content down, you couldn't do a better job than that. You had to, you had to just, if your tools were crude you, because you couldn't investigate what you had and then you couldn't do a very effective job. So basically you got out of the content moderation business because you could not afford legally to be in the content moderation business because that meant you were paying attention to what was there and if you paid attention to what was there, then all of a sudden you became responsible for what you found and your choices were always going to be subject to challenge and that's just too expensive because this happens on a scale that most people cannot get their heads around. Even the smallest platform deal with thousands if not millions of posts in very short periods of time. So yeah, uh, the common law uh, torts that were at issue in uh, a bunch of the cases that motivated Section 230, you know, common law evolves. It doesn't always evolve that quickly. It evolves through a series of court decisions over time. And, you know, I, I think there is a possible world in which we got, without Section 230, we got gradual movement towards uh, uh, something that continued to protect the First Amendment despite, um, you know, lots of litigation from people who wanted to bring defamation claims. But, uh, but that would not have been fast, and it certainly wouldn't have been at the pace that would have enabled uh, this technology, which was quite new, the Internet, uh, to, to blossom and, and prosper. So I, I think that Section 230 um, stepped in there. Congress stepped in and said, hey, we see a problem here. Uh, we want this innovation. Uh, we want um, we want it to be in a way that lets people deliver what they use what users want without being sued out of existence by uh, under a system that is quite different from the rest of the world in a lot of different ways. But one way in particular is that we don't have a loser uh, pays sort of provision that says, "Hey, if you bring a spurious lawsuit, then you have to." Yeah, and you impose costs on somebody that you that you then have to like compensate them back, and that's. Uh, and that system just means that if you see somebody with big pockets, it's worth the risk to, take, to lose in court because you're just out a little bit of money, but you might get a, a whole lot of money at the end. And or, so, or you troll yeah. a lot of people with small pockets. Or yeah, or you troll a lot of people with small pockets, uh, and uh, and fixing that problem is a much bigger one. Well, it's bigger in sort of it's more general than social media uh, and Section 230. But Section 230 steps into that and is a, a, a good start, maybe, for, for how we might treat other areas where there is a certain level of scale and where the, uh, the deep-pocketed intermediaries are likely to face uh, lots of targeted uh, and uh, litigation. I think I'm going to go to another question. We're, br we're bringing another mic. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Juan Londoño with Taxpayers Protection Alliance. So I think this this panel and all the panels today have, have shown the dichotomy of what's happening with, with this um, this case, where probably platforms are going to be forced to carry that, like you know, the, all all viewpoints and, and potentially dangerous viewpoints. But if we zoom out to other bills and other lawsuits that are happening around the country that want to make platforms liable for dangerous content and and allege that platforms designed that lead to harms should uh, held these platforms liable, we ended a compliance nightmare. And, and if all those dominoes were to fall in that place, in this nightmare scenario, you think platforms would err in the side of uh, that hyper-regulation or hyper-moderation of only poppy content, extremely safe content, or it would go to a side of no moderation at all and, and, and just let everything fly and just say, look, we're not even moderating. We cannot, we cannot be held liable for what's going on here. Possibly both, and neither are good. Um, I think there are some platforms that will be in a position where they'll try to hang on, but they'll basically be like, we can't touch anything because uh, we're not protected. Um, I mean, that is a particular problem if Section 230 takes a hit, but I think even these cases implicate uh, that problem. Um, but you know, if they're being forced to do things in certain ways, they'll have to take very conservative views about what is the okay content. Um, that's going to be very narrow. We may not even agree on the puppies and kittens because 
we may have to choose puppies or kittens. So everything can be contentious, and I don't think there's going to be a lot of safe content, but we will end up with such an anodine online ecosystem because that is the only thing that will be available, and companies will limp along and try to do the best they can, but it's not going to be good. Neil, before I let you go in, I, I jump in. I, I have to bring up because we've we've used this puppies and kittens example multiple times uh, through the course of this event, and it ha has to make me think of one of my favorite subreddits that I have learned about, which is a subreddit that is only pictures of cats standing up. So everyone's got it. The rule is cats standing up. Simple subreddit: what you can and cannot post. Cats standing up. How many legs does a cat stand up on? Oh dear. Ah, big fight. Very, very quick to get to the type of, of concern, even with some of these, yeah. you know, you're only going to allow puppy pictures. How old is a puppy? Like, when does a puppy become a dog? I call every dog a puppy, therefore can I post this picture, mm -hmm. you know, type of, of thing. I think even in these, these hyper contextualized situations, it can still get tough and there still can be some degree of viewpoint involved. And I think that's the thing that kind of runs through these policy tensions, where even if you take the, the, assume that some of these regulators are well-intentioned, because they're looking at problems that are, you know, externalities from the internet, which are socially undesirable, you get so focused on that, and you're like, shouldn't it be easy to just get rid of that? As you're pointing out, we can't even necessarily agree that that is worth striking out, but that's not the pic, even if we could, that's not the whole picture. The internet is reflecting all of humanity and there's, what are we up to, eight billion of us now? We're a lot of people and complex and wrinkled and nuanced and different and varying. How do you reduce our social experience which we can replicate online into something where we can say good, bad, good, bad, good, bad, like, and I think our notion, we have this illusion that we can control. You can't, you can't. Even the most well-meaning regulator cannot control the online world as perfectly as they'd want to any more than they can control the offline world as perfectly as they might like to control it. You can't have that and also have a thriving humanity. Having written a book called Getting Out of Control, I love that last point, that's very good. Um, uh, on the, on the, the impacts of these laws on what the companies do, I, I think one thing that hasn't come up much although Paul Clement like, mentioned it multiple times in oral argument, is that Florida has a, um, uh, where individuals can sue to enforce the law. And with a $100,000, I think, uh, uh, judgment possible. And so that's like the opposite of tort reform, right? And, and that is monetizing uh, the sort of online gripe ecosystem where if anything happens to you and you don't get like full disclosure about exactly what it was, you're gonna be able to bring a lawsuit. You might not win. In fact, uh, uh, you, you, uh, maybe, you won't, maybe you won't win at all, um, but it might be worth it you know, to do that uh, because not only will you win sometimes, but also you're gonna shape the conduct of the companies in a way that is, is much different than say, uh, where the companies are in constant communication with uh, you know, a, a prosecutor who has limited resources and limited incentives necessarily, and also can be sort of cajoled into not doing something occasionally. So neither of those are great situations, but the Florida pri right, private right of action, I think is especially uh, ripe for abuse by people who want to sue deep pockets. So we're running out of time. I know we had a lot of great questions come in online and that there are some people in the room that I wasn't able to get to. Hopefully, you know, we'll be able to continue these conversations both online uh, on the various platforms that you and our other speakers are on, as well as for those of you who are in the room over lunch shortly. If we could first all take this opportunity to join me in thanking all of our speakers, not only on this panel, but throughout the day. Needless to say, I think one of the big takeaways has been that there's still plenty to discuss. Whatever we end up hearing from the court in the next four or so months about the future of, the, of these cases and what that might mean for the future of online speech, there are plenty of other topics going on that we didn't even touch on today, whether it was the upcoming case formerly known as Missouri v. Biden, now Murphy v. M Missouri, whether it's the ongoing debate around some of the other state social media laws laws that we've seen that were not part of this challenge, or whether it's what we started to discuss in this last panel about debates around speech and generative AI or what's going on in other countries. 
So I know that myself and my Cato colleagues, as well as our, several of our panelists, are always looking into and writing about these topics, and I would invite you to follow all those that work online uh, via various platforms or, or via different individuals' methods of sharing. For those of you that are here with us, this is going to conclude our sessions. I thank you for joining, and lunch will be served upstairs. For those of you online, this also concludes our sessions, and I thank you for joining and look forward to seeing your conversation online. Thank you. Thank you.